Hello, I'm Mark McClellan. I'm the director of the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy, and I'd like to welcome all of you to today's meeting. Um, it's uh, day two of our meeting on data sharing to accelerate therapeutic development for rare diseases. This is being convened under a cooperative agreement with the FDA. Today, we're going to follow a similar format to yesterday with a series of presentations, some reactant panels, and a moderated discussion session or set of moderated discussion sessions focused on examples of how shared data is being leveraged to support clinical trial readiness and conduct. Uh, before we begin, we'd like to start out by engaging you all uh, with another short poll. Um, I'd like to then provide a brief synopsis of what we heard yesterday, and then we'll, then we'll get going with our, our use cases for today. So uh, starting off, here's the, here's the poll question for you. Please do respond. Um, this will give us a sense of the uh, group's composition and also hopefully get you used to uh, participating actively in this meeting. Um, so uh, what category best describes the organization you're representing today and uh, we'll display the results in in just a minute uh, again we we very much appreciate your participation uh, in this uh, Duke FDA uh, uh, event All right, and I'd like to uh, start out with, uh, uh, as we're seeing the results here um, coming in, we've got, a, just like yesterday, a diversity of stakeholder groups represented today. Um, we appreciate uh, all of you who are responding, and uh, uh, for those who haven't, um, uh, I think uh, we may be about out of time, but uh, you get a sense of the, the variety of perspectives that we're bringing together. So thank you again for, for joining us. Um, so let me, let me move on to the, um, uh, the next slide around um, the few reminders on our meeting format and how we're going to try to organize the, this uh, virtual setting to make it as productive as possible. Um, like yesterday, we've got a group of rare disease subject matter experts. Uh, they have their um, speaking roles listed on the agenda. And we've also got a number of, disease, of rare disease stakeholders who have registered for the public meeting. We're really glad that you all are able to, to join us today. Uh, just want to remind you that the meeting materials will be available on the Duke Margolis event website. We also have Twitter information on the website. Uh, for those of you who uh, do tweet or want to tweet uh, about this meeting, please feel free to do so using the hashtag, uh, hashtag rare, rare data share. So hashtag rare data share. Uh, for our workshop speakers, uh, Mira Gill um, from our team will advance the slide deck on our end. Just give us a verbal prompt when you'd like us to move to the next slide. And if you would like to speak during the open discussion portions of the meeting, either during uh, your session, if you're a speaker, or during the other sessions, uh, please switch on your camera and raise your virtual hand by clicking on that participants tab at the bottom and, uh, and then clicking raise hand uh, uh, within that um, um, window when it comes up. When you're not speaking, just want to remind everyone to stay muted so we can keep the sound as uh, good as possible. For those of you who are not listed speakers but are registered to participate and are um, uh, joining us to get today, again, welcome. Uh, we want your participation as well. If you'd like to ask a question or make a comment during the open discussion portion of the meetings, uh, please type it into the Zoom chat box using that chat uh, function at the bottom of the, uh, the Zoom screen, or you can email us directly at rd data at duke.edu. And for everyone, it's a reminder, during the presentations, we want to get through those without interruptions. But if you do have a comment, uh, please enter it into the chat box. And, and we'll also come back to further discussion in the open, uh, in the open session part of uh, each of these um, meeting sessions. Um, we have a very full agenda today. And to make sure we wrap up on time, we uh, really want to hear from all of our presenters, but we want to hear from them efficiently. So I uh, want to make sure that our speakers, our main presenters could keep their remarks to 15 minutes uh, or less. 
and our reactants uh, to uh, keep their responses to five minutes or less uh, to give us time for those panel discussions. Um, Kelly Wall uh, from Duke Margolis will be helping uh, you and all of us keep track of time. You'll get some timing prompts uh, via the Zoom chat uh, during the uh, portion where you're making comments. And if you do have any questions about the meetings or technical issues uh, related to the meeting, uh, please um, email Rashid Willis, um, either, um, either, sorry, either uh, message him via Zoom, so that's Rashid Willis, or um, send an email to rwillis at newmediamill.com, rwillis at newmediamill.com, just like it says at the bottom of the screen here, uh, with any technical issues. We're gonna have a recording of of the meeting available on the Duke Margolis website and YouTube channel after the conclusion of this event. And uh, wanna remind you as well that we are convening this meeting in cooperation with the FDA. This is not a federal advisory committee. We're not gonna vote uh, uh, or reach a firm conclusion on, on particular topics. Uh, we are very much interested in input and perspectives. Uh, so no votes, but the meeting will be a success if there is a, a strong and frank exchange of ideas, lively exchange of ideas, and open discussion on these very important and timely topics to help us all find a, a good path forward. Uh, we're very pleased again that you're able to join us today and look forward to uh, a productive uh, discussion. Uh, this is going to build on the meeting from yesterday. If you go to the next slide, um, we covered a lot of ground then uh, with some great presentations and uh, discussion. I just wanted to spend a few minutes summarizing some of the main themes that we heard yesterday and what we hope to carry forward into the discussions today. Uh, we heard from uh, Tina, Katie, others yesterday about the transparency, efficiency, and cost benefits associated with the use of shared data resources. And it was also helpful to hear about FDA and NIH support for the implementation of robust data sharing tools, platforms, and, and networks. Uh, we also found it very helpful to discuss some of the commonalities in rare disease symptomatologies and core clinical outcomes. Uh, that provides a, a way to use data from specific rare diseases to support therapeutic advancement in others. Those kinds of synergies are exactly what we're hoping, we're hoping this meeting could, could bring out and help us find ways to, to build on. And then finally, we heard a great deal about the importance of tools, such as data standards in ensuring quality in the design of data collection schemes and the management of transparent and sustainable shared data resources. So these are topics that we're gonna keep exploring today. And in particular, we want to discuss how we can best leverage high quality electronic health record data to support disease characterization and clinical research. Uh, there are a lot of benefits from being able to do this. They include uh, better integrating data collection into routine clinical care, uh, maintaining high fidelity between the data that are used in research and, research and the original source uh, data and minimizing burden on patients and their families and also making sure that the data collection is really relevant to the clinicians who need to participate as well. And it seems like we had a lot of support around the uh, idea that we can and should all work together to enhance this data sharing infrastructure and tools to support therapeutic development for rare diseases. So this is a very uh, important topic that we hope to build on today. Uh, we are going to explore some of the existing efforts for doing that now, and also how to best align and augment these efforts going forward. Um, so we're looking forward to carrying on this conversation uh, with you. And let me uh, uh, now uh, introduce the, the agenda for today uh, by just uh, going through the, the, the key sessions. So we're gonna start with a session on platform analytics tools to support rare disease drug development. Uh, that's gonna include a discussion of several use cases with presentations and remarks covering the structure and characteristics of some rare disease data sharing platforms that are in use now. Uh, as well as some of the specific tools and outputs generated by shared data platforms that can help build efficiencies into the conduct of clinical trials. We'll talk about some of the cross-cutting challenges and platform management, and then we're also gonna hear 
uh, perspectives from some of the data consumers as well as data contributors about the process associated with collecting the data and uh, contributing it to shared platforms and then transforming and using it uh, in research. So that's session four. Uh, then in session five on collaborative research networks to support rare disease drug development, we'll discuss how research consortia are positioned to support preclinical research in rare diseases and how clinical trial networks and common or shared research, research tools like uh, drug development tools or uh, supports for protocol development and data management and regulatory review, how these kinds of tools can streamline the uh, ability to, to collect and make clinical data uh, useful and more efficiently available for rare disease research. Um, then we'll talk about uh, some of the considerations and challenges associated with facilitating research participant engagement and enrollment and data sharing through a central coordinating center to support the evaluation of drug safety and efficacy and regulatory submission. So a lot of topics related to the use of collaborative research networks for drug development. And that's all gonna to lead to session six on uh, synthesis and some next steps with the goals of encouraging the clinical trial readiness of preclinical data, uh, building off of these systems, the use of shared data in clinical trials, and the sharing and reuse of clinical data clinical trial data for secondary purposes. Um, we'll also talk about some of the opportunities for stakeholders to collaborate on supports, uh, incentives, uh, key principles for designing and implementing shared data collection um, effectively, management and governance of, of the data and how to do it effectively, uh, all with the goal of really leveraging these existing systems have the, uh, the most impact possible on rare disease uh, drug development. So, um, so let's get started. Um, with that, I'd like to begin with our first uh, use case session, session four on the next slide. Uh, on platform analytic tools to support rare disease drug development. Um, so this is our first use case session. We're gonna cover the structure and characteristics of several rare disease data sharing platforms and some of the tools and outputs generated by uh, these platforms that help make clinical trial conduct more efficient and effective. We're gonna cover some of the challenges with platform management and some of the considerations for contributing and using shared data as part of efforts like this. Again, if you have any questions or comments along the way, please send them in using the, the chat function. And uh, you can also email us at rd.data at duke.edu. Um, please introduce our speakers for this session. Uh, Jane Larkendale is Executive Director for the Rare Disease Cures Accelerator Data and Analytics Platform, RDCA DAP, and the Duchesne Regulatory Sciences Consortium at the Critical Path Institute. And then our reactants include Rebecca Lee, who's Executive Director of Vivli, uh, Mike uh, Feolo, the team lead for the database of genotypes and phenotypes at the National Institutes of Health, and Mads Dalsgaard, who's Senior Vice President and Global Head of Experimental Medicine and Clinical Development at Lundbeck. Uh, and then uh, Atul Badharam, who's Senior Staff Fellow in the Division of Pharmacometrics at FDA. Um, so uh, with that, uh, Jane, let me turn this over to you. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you very much to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak about our exciting project today. I'm actually really quite looking forward to this panel and the opportunity to talk to uh, other people who are also in the data sharing space and how we can all collaborate together because this is such an important area. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm really excited to talk about the Rare Disease Cures Accelerator data and analytics platform because it's a relatively new project that I think has a really unique role in the data sharing universe and the potential to do a huge amount of good. This is a project that was launched between the Critical Path Institute or CPATH and the National Organization for Rare Disorders. And it's really data sharing with a very specific goal. There are well over 7,000 rare diseases depending on how you define them. And more than 90% of these don't have a treatment. And most, many, many, many of these diseases are not even well characterized. We don't know how they progress. We don't know how they change over time. And we, we, we started this initiative really with the goal of very specifically of bringing together data, sharing data with the community so that we can characterize these rare diseases better and accelerate drug development. 
our focus is very much on drug development and bringing data together to accelerate new, new treatments and cures for patients. Next slide. So we, we, we set ourselves up to be a neutral, independent, integrated database and analytics hub. Um, we have really specifically designed to build novel drug development tools that are of a regulatory grade that can really be used to accelerate drug development. And there are several stages to this. First of all, um, we, um, we, we set out to promote data sharing. Um, obviously across all rare diseases, we're not in any in specific rare disease. We, the data that comes into us is not just dumped into a database, have a go at it. We bring it in, we curate it, we standardize it. And we really do the best we can, depending on the data that comes in, to try and integrate it into larger data sets. So we have the amount of data that we really need to do exciting analyses and the sorts of analyses that we can use to, develop, um, to move drug development forwards. We haven't yet got it, but we're in the process of building an analytics platform, which will help us really use that data, understand what data we have, search the data, not just within a disease, but across diseases look at the data, understand the data, make sure that, that we have an appropriate distribution of data, and then use subsets of the data to build advanced model informed drug development tools. And I'm going to talk further as I move through this presentation about what the sorts of tools I'm talking about. But again, we're really looking at things to move drug development forwards, not just research for the sake of research, although that's really important too, but what can we do at a regulatory grade level that we can really use to move, move drug development forwards? And overall, that we hope that this helps us build a better understanding of, you know, of each rare disease, the progression of rare diseases, provide tools like biomarkers and endpoints and understanding of those, those so that we can build better tri clinical trials and, pr and provide data that will really support regulatory submissions and eventually approvals of new drugs and therapies. So that's what we're setting out to do. Next slide, please. You've seen versions of the slides before because much thanks to our, some of my colleagues, this um, variants of the slide were produced, were shown yesterday and gave you a great introduction to our particular platform. We're really looking holistically at different types of data, bringing in all kinds of different data, bringing it into CEPA and then um, and sharing that with the community and then being able to share it out to the community insofar as each individual contributor is comfortable with. We'd like to believe everyone's comfortable sharing their data at all times. We know this isn't the case. So as we bring data into CEPA, the contributor or custodian tells us what we can do with that data and how widely we can share it. As I mentioned, we bring the data in and we curate it, we go through it, we make sure there's nothing in it that sounds ridiculous. If there are things in it that look impossible, like a 250 year old woman, we will go back to the, back to the contributor and make sure that we have the data accurately transferred. We standardize it. All our data will be compatible with CDISC standards if it's the type of data that can be put into CDISC standards and we annotate the metadata so it can be searched. It then goes into a pool of data for analysis. Some of that will be nice, rigidly, system systematically defined data sets, and some of it will be more, um, our platform architect describes this as a lake of data, which sounds very unstructured, but trust me, it's not really that unstructured. But the idea is people can then go in and really search through that data in lots of different orthogonal ways. If you're interested in understanding the progression of an individual disease, you can pull out the data on that individual disease. If you're interested in a biomarker, you can pull out the data on that biomarker. If you're interested in related diseases, pull that out. Maybe you're interested in a particular symptom, pull that data out. And then we have three different interfaces. The first one's an interrogator to really help you understand what data is in there. So that if we don't have the data you need, you can stop immediately and not waste your time. If, you, if the data appears to be there, yep, you have data on the disease I'm interested in. It doesn't have the distribution we expect, the age ranges I expect, it does it include the outcome measures I'm interested in. And you can really interrogate that and do some basic statistics in that interrogator, uh, an interrogator at a fairly high level. Once you've determined the data that you want is there, you can either go to interface two where you can generate a, sub a subset of the data and pull it out for analysis or interface three, which is our advanced data analytics workbench, where you can use all sorts of advanced mathematical tools to really work on that data, build drug development tools, do advanced analyses, and understand whatever it is your question is in the system. I should say the, uh, the analytics interface is not built yet. We have the ability to take in data, we can curate and standardize data, and we can even share it with the community, but we're still in the process of building the analytics platform, but we hope to have more on that soon. Next slide. 
Needless to say, this is not an easy project. We have a lot of challenges as we move forward, the, forward uh, with the project. And many of these I think will be great to discuss as we move through the panel today. Obviously just gaining access to shared patient level data across rare diseases is a challenge. Patients have privacy concerns, particularly if, uh, if you're talking about very rare diseases or genomic data, which you can't completely anonymize. Our platform is designed to only deal with the identified data, but in some cases it's very difficult to reach true anonymization. And we're working through some of those issues. There are issues with GDPR and accessing data from Europe. Rare diseases are international. They're small populations. We need data from all around the world. And we're coming up with solutions to being able to share data with Europe um, and be able to make that available through our platform. And of course, there are always concerns about data ownership, the value of the data. Do we want to share the data with a platform like this that's going to make it freely available? And those are all things we're working, working through. At the same time, um, other people um, in this great big partnership are working on things like making sure the data we bring in is of a suitable quality, that we're curating it appropriately, that we're standardizing it. Certain, um, much of the data we've worked with in the past has been appropriate to stand, standardize with CDISC, but are there other standards for other types of data? What sort of ontologies do we want to use to make sure that we can search the data that we want? We have to make sure that we understand that disparate data elements collected in different studies can be integrated or they may sound the same, but are somewhat different. And sometimes there's limitations on how the measurements were taken. And we have to go back and do some work to understand is my six minute walk distance the same as your six minute walk distance? Can we combine those measures or not? And at the same time, we have to make sure we maintain this database, keep it up to date, make sure over time that the data continues to be relevant and updated and we're bringing new data in all the time because the natural history of these rare diseases is changing over time. Standards of care change, therapies change. And that's all things that we're thinking about now as we plan the platform to make sure it is a robust piece of infrastructure and remains useful and valuable over time. Next slide. Obviously, we're not new to this. CPATH has been around for 15 years. We have a lot of data in-house. We have currently about 120,000 patients worth of data. What's interesting looking at this graph is that um, a lot of that actually, by chance, is already in rare diseases. We've worked in a number of rare disease spaces, but working in individual diseases at a time. And as we expand into this rare disease cures accelerated data and analytics platform, we're really going to increase the amount of rare disease data but we're building on what we've done before in the previous or, previous or ongoing disease consortia that we're already working in. So with that, I'm going to change tack slightly. And instead of talking about the platform itself and what we're planning to do, I'm going to go into some, so, um, some concrete examples of what we've done with the data in the past. Next slide, please. So obviously the idea of bringing in data is not to bring in data in itself. Sorry, no, um, the idea is to use that data. And I'm going to give you a few examples of this, a lengthy example of the work done by the Duchenne Regulatory Science Consortium that I run, and then just some very quick snapshots of some other tools we've built. So Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a rare disease. It's a very variable rare disease. And there were a lot of issues when we started this project in understanding the progression of the disease, the variance and progression of the disease, what clinical endpoints to use, and really understanding how to build effective clinical trials. Next slide. So we set out to really try and resolve that, um, those, those issues. And to do that, we needed data. This is a data sharing meeting. Of course, I'm going to talk about data sharing. We now have 20 different data sets in Fiducian. They vary between clinical trial data, natural history data, data straight from the clinic, a patient registry. Those data collections vary massively in size. Some of them are tiny. Some of them are reasonable size considering it's a rare disease. They look at different populations of patients and they were collected over different periods of time and they all collected different measurements. So we brought all that data in, we curated it, we standardized it just like we're going to do with our DCA DAP and we pulled out our initial analysis that you can click again. And that's over a thousand patients. We now probably have almost twice that in our, in our current analysis data set. So we brought all of that data together in, so you can click two more times this, um, and we're using those data to build disease progression models, models to really describe how endpoints change over time in this disease. So we took all of that data, we looked at all of the longitudinal data we had on a number of different endpoints and all the covariates that were in the data, things that might affect that progression, and, and are turning them into models. The goal of those models is to really understand the disease, the trajectory of the disease, the rate of change, the predictors of the rate of change, the variance in that disease, and we're using the data to build a web-based clinical trial simulator. Next slide. 
So the next slide um, really just describes the problem. You can see those massive points. These are the six endpoints we're looking at. And you can see each of those is a great big furball of individual points where, although there are trends in how these, disease, um, these endpoints change over time, they're non-linear, they're very variable, and they all are sensitive to change at different, different age groups and in different stages of disease. Next slide. So we use that data to build a series of mixed effects models. I'm not gonna go into the models in detail, but the bottom line is you can see in the left-hand graph on a population level and on the right-hand side at an individual level, you can see that our models really do correlate with, with the actual observations pretty well. Next slide. The models also show us different populations. You'll see here as the slide builds, the, the red line was a typical patient. The green line is those on steroids. They reach a higher peak in this particular endpoint, but then they decline if they have certain mutation groups. They, are, they also have a higher peak, but they also shift to the right. D disease progression is later and slower. And if you're both, you, you have an even greater effect. So we can start to tease out different populations of patients and really understand how progression is measured by a particular endpoint in a particular group of patients. Next slide. We're using those models to, um, to really understand the population. We can move to the next one because I understand I'm about to run out of time. Um, we can, we're using those models to build what we call a clinical trial simulation tool, which is a user-friendly interface where we can go in, look at the a study duration, a length of the clinical trial, how often we want to look at the patients, put in the population of patients we think we're going to include in our trial, and put in our assumed drug effect, which is going to be based on what we know about the drug already from preclinical work or earlier trials. And then we run simulations and we look at it. Does, uh, does the, the drug show the effect, expected effect in this trial design? No, well, never mind. We'll go back and try again because this is all done on a computer and I can change my inclusion criteria. I can change the length of the trial. I can change the number of patients until I design it, the optimal clinical trial that will show me the drug effect I'm expecting to see if the drug does what I expect to see it. See, so that's what we're trying to do in Duchenne. Really optimize clinical trials. Use all of this integrated data to help people design clinical trials that will really tell us if our drug will work or not. And this is an example in a rare disease where there's not a huge amount of data. There's more data than there are in some diseases, but we can really start to understand how to run, run drug trials, how to develop drugs in a much more efficient way. Next slide. I'm gonna to touch on this very, these very quickly, which is some other examples of the sorts of tools we can build from integrated data, which we've done at CPAR. And these are the sorts of things we hope to do with RDCA DAP and the data that we're bringing in there. Biomarkers, hugely important to under, uh, get a quick read on whether a drug will work or not. In polycystic kidney disease, which is a rare disease, we qualified total kidney volume as a prognostic biomarker to show which populations of patients were likely to progress with their disease. It's now accepted as a reasonably likely surrogate endpoint, and actually a drug has been approved on those. Again, this was based on pooled, data, pooled integrated data from a number of different studies, which we used to really understand how the biomarker worked and how it could be used for a drug approval. If you click again, another example of some work we've done in the Parkinson's space where we're looking at dopamine transporter positive patients to enrich trials. This has been investigated as an enrichment tool. And in this particular example, the simulations done with using these models, you could reduce the sample size by 25% and get the same power by using this enrichment biomarker. So again, understanding progression of disease, understanding how to enrich your population, and understanding how to run more effective clinical trials. Then my final example is an Alzheimer's disease. Again, this is a series of models built. This is not a rare disease, obviously, but really trying to understand different types of trials, how you could simulate different types of trials based on a population, and again, understand the best possible clinical trial design. Final slide. Uh, so the, fi the, fi um, the final slide I wanted to show was this one, which really just talk summarizes what I've already said. The RDCA DEP is a centralized and standardized infrastructure really to support rare disease characterization to support regulatory submissions. We're going to aggregate data, integrate data to give us, get as much data together to answer all of these questions. We're providing analytical tools to really support development of these sorts of tools that will optimize clinical trials and drug development. We can look across diseases and look at, different, at all sorts of different questions within the data set. And you'll be able to find and match historical and contemporary control patients to enrich your placebo arm, help understand how your trial, trial might progress and really optimize drug development. This is a project that we're doing with Nord and with the FDA to really try and improve rare disease drug development, make it more efficient and get treatments 
to patients as quickly and as, as efficiently as possible. And I know I went a little bit over time, so I apologize, but thank you very much for the opportunity and I look forward to the discussion. Uh, Jane, thank you. Covered a lot of ground. I appreciate including the specific illustrations of how our DCA has helped uh, optimize trials already. So thanks very much. And, uh, and next up is uh, Rebecca Lee. Hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca Lee. I'm the executive director of Vivly. Really delighted to be here. Um, next slide, please. So by the numbers today, you know, Vivly is a, um, a global data sharing platform. We have over 5,000 clinical trials. And then you can just progress this. Uh, this represents approximately 3 million participants from over 100 countries. Uh, we have uh, 28 members or data contributors, and these are uh, diverse data contributors from a number of, uh, from pharma, um, academic data contributors, foundations, and biotechs. Uh, the next slide really shows you um, the members or data contributors, and as you can see, if you advance the slide, uh, who these are. Um, some of these do contribute data that are, oh, sorry, um, if you can just go back one. Um, one slide, uh, the data contributors that we do have uh, do contribute uh, rare disease data. Um, many of the pharma companies have rare disease data. Um, foundations like Cure Duchenne and others, um, but there are challenges and I'm happy to discuss them in the panel discussion. Um, and, and Jane raised many of the challenges of, of rare disease, um, of contributing rare disease data. Next slide, please. Uh, the next slide really talks about our process and how uh, data really works, uh, getting data really works for a, a data requester. So the first step, um, if you step through this slide, really talks about um, the search. So someone would come to the Vivli platform and walk through the search process and look for information about available studies. And then they would go through our request form. So we have um, a harmonized request form, which really means that you can request data from any one of the 28 data contributors in a single form and request IPD, so individual participant level data um, in a single form. And each data request is really reviewed according to um, the contributors publicly stated requirements. Uh, the next step would really be um, getting access. So if the um, proposal is approved, um, then the data is accessed in our secure research environment or downloadable by permission. Um, upon access, um, the data is then analyzed in a secure research environment um, using tools that we provide, so an analytical or statistical tools to combine and analyze multiple data sets. And then uh, next, you can see that we follow that all the way through publication. So we assign a digital object identifier uh, to, to the uh, publication and researchers use Vivli to meet their publication re requirements. Um, the next slide really talks about, um, really visualizes really the secure environment and how really what makes us um, in a sense somewhat different is that we allow bridging between different platforms. So this depicts um, potentially someone in front of their computer. There, um, we allow researchers to bring their own data, scripts, software on request. So this is showing someone bringing in data from BioLink, for example, one of the NIH platforms. Uh, we've heard from Johnson & Johnson, who uses the Yoda product project to share, um, GSK, AbbVie, and you can do that in one, in one platform. This really demonstrates how we are, in some sense, uh, the intermediary to bring together data contributors and those requesting data, um, in, a, in, in, in a sense, as the bridge. And then, um, for rare diseases in particular, and I just want to wrap up, um, if that data resides in platforms that are interconnected, um, we can really help uh, move the science quickly towards a more co cohesive scientific understanding, being able to integrate data together. But the flip side, as I'm sure we all understand here, is if there's only isolated pockets of data that are shared, um, or there are delays in sharing, or that, delay, uh, that data is siloed, 
then we as a society really lose valuable time in closing gaps in our scientific understanding of these rare diseases. Um, so that's one thing for us to keep in mind as we talk through um, data sharing and rare diseases. So that really concludes my talk today and I look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you. Rebecca, thank you very much for those comments. Great point to end on that I hope we can come back to. Um, and next is Mike. Hello. Um, thanks. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me today. And um, um, I was asked um, to be here, I think, because uh, I am the team lead for a product at the NCBI called DBGAP. Very similar to both of these um, um, resources that you um, just witnessed. Um, I think the big difference is, is we do not have an analytic platform in dbGaP. We store the data, we try to normalize it the best we can, and then we distribute the data as is, as we received it to researchers. Um, I think um, some of the challenges uh, that we've seen recently um, in dbGaP, we're, it's about 13 years old now. Um, and uh, currently the NIH is really moving towards a um, federated model for data sharing. Um, dbGaP was originally created for uh, the sharing of GWAS data, um, genome-wide association data, from, uh, primarily from GWAS chips and the associated phenotypic clinical and exposure data for those studies. Um, uh, in the last uh, eight or so years, we've increasingly um, become a repository for a lot of other omics data, um, expression data and, and metabolomics and those kind of things. Um, most recently, we were running into a challenge with getting a fair number of uh, wearable device um, data, um, and that that poses its own problems because of the size. Um, NIH is moving towards this federated model of uh, data sharing because dbGaP has limited resources, and there's a lot of funding agencies and a lot of money going out to these studies. And so, a number of the large institutes, the NIH, have, uh, are producing their own. Um, mostly cloud storage sites and uh, analytical platforms. Um, and we at uh, NCBI will probably play a role at least in the near term for the registration of those studies and um, probably the access approval, at least for some of those resources. So um, the challenges with federation um, come down to um, uh, the research data really, um, it's not standardized. And um, the, the data that come in are, are rarely collected in, uh, with uh, um, standardized uh, collection protocols or even later um, mapped to control vocabularies. Um, you know, this, this standardization really ideally should be done at the time of collection. Uh, it is possible to, after the fact, try to map these, um, these variables um, that are collected to standardized ontologies and, and controlled vocabularies, but this poses a problem with the granularity of the controlled vocabulary versus the data. And um, we've always taken the, the tact not to change the data in any way. Um, so we don't do a lot of harmonization at dbGaP. Um, this poses problems for the end users because um, essentially the harmonization has to be done at the time of analysis. And so each, each um, data downloader is, is, uh, is doing the harmonization as they see fit. Um, another, another big issue with um, the way the NIH is moving towards this federated model is that most of these platforms are cloud-based. And this is, um, it's convenient for a lot of reasons, but it does have its challenges because there's a large number of researchers out there that just 
are not technically savvy using the cloud environments. And so there's a, a training component to to this as, as um, and then um, I think some of the other notes that I wrote down, um, I think there's a, there's another problem with um, federation, which really has to do with if there are multiple data stores, um, the access control and authentication of the users to each data set has to be coordinated in some fashion and transferred across these, these various disparate systems. And um, that's actually something that's in active development at NIH right now um, to create this kind of um, genomic, at least genomic based um, kind of uh, cloud um, data sharing ecosystem. And so dbGaP is involved in that. And, and um, there may be some questions about that. But I think I'll leave it there. and. Um, let others respond as well. All right, Mike, thank you very much. Uh, next, we'd like to go to Mods. Yes, thanks a lot, Mark. So uh, I would also like to thank the organizers for, for this opportunity. Uh, I I'm here, I think, because of uh, I'm wearing three hats, basically, right? I'm, I'm a consumer working for a sponsor or a company, consumer of data, uh, big time consumer of big data, so to speak. Uh, but I'm also a contributor or representing a company that is a contributor to the data. In fact, to, to two of the platforms mentioned here earlier in, in this session, one of them is the, is the Critical Path Initiative and the other is the Vivlu platform. And then finally, and I was looking for a word uh, with C, but I would say I'm a convinced advocate of the importance of sharing the data. So I'll just try here over the next two or three minutes to, to cover a few of these elements. So I would start actually on the consumer side uh, and really just echo what, what Jane was going through a little while ago. Um, I think from the viewpoint of, of, uh, of a sponsor, you know, really leveraging data is, is becoming, you know, the default way to, to make intelligent uh, trial and programs. It's about, of course, ultimately benefit for the patients, but of course, in a near term view, also for the benefit of me really making successful studies and, and programs. And how would we do that? Well, Jane went through that eloquently, but some of that would be you know, modeling trajectories, understanding the natural progression, the untreated placebo group, uh, modeling uh, around data, potentially defining new endpoints. If you're lucky enough to have biomarkers in the data set, then the, the you know, the combined force of understanding biomarkers and, 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 and outcome measures to, to really be able to, to detect the effect. We also, of course, uh, dreaming about utilizing some of these data to support our dialogue with the, the regulators uh, and substantiating you know, meaningful, clinically meaningfulness, evidence and so forth for registration purposes. Some of these can be quite advanced uh, around digital trends and so forth. The reason for mentioning this uh, as, a, as a default way of working is because of course in, in rare diseases, the importance of this is really just multiplied uh, several fold because there is scarcity of data, there's typically less knowledge uh, even on the clinical or the scientific side. So, so there's just more emphasis uh, on the importance of doing this. Then on the contributor side, uh, we fairly recently had the pleasure of sharing a large data set. It was a, a non-rare disease, but, but nevertheless, I think there are some, some important lessons here. I, I took note, Mark, when you, when you earlier did the poll on who was joining, I noticed that 25% of, of people joining here are from sponsors. So if, if some of you are are contemplating sitting on data sets, uh, I would really, really encourage uh, that you share those and, and maybe I can help lower the barrier for doing it. So I think first and foremost, of course, there are things that need to be in place. Uh, GDPR, how, how was patients uh, consented? Are you, are you even in a position to be able to share the data based on, 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 on these fundamental things? If you are in a company or a sponsor like, like I am, of course, there's also, you can say the, the, the relative uh, place of the data importance uh, for the company. I noticed that uh, the Carla from JNJ made some notes uh, on this on, on day one. Uh, of course, there may be data that the company is not ready to share, but I think overall what I see across different companies is that there's an increasing openness and move towards 
transparency and less concern about sharing data uh, and sharing what used to be, I guess, considered competitive uh, knowledge. So there's an increasing openness moving in this regard. And then, of course, uh, this, the collaboration with the, with the platforms, uh, I think in our case, sharing with the critical path was really a tremendous uh, and, uh, and surprisingly easy process. Uh, great support, professionalism, helping remove barriers, very easy setup. And I think as a sponsor and as a company, when you have, uh, you know, having the responsibility of having, you know, assumed responsibility for data for, for patients, you really want somebody to take good care of that. And I think uh, these two platforms mentioned here today really offer that, right? It's a secure environment. They're, they're set up that allows, you know, professional scientists, high, highly esteemed academics uh, to view research proposals and so forth. So you can really rest assured that your data are, are in good hands and, and even relieve some of the burden uh, from you um, as a sponsor in, in, in these regards. And then finally, as a convinced advocate, uh, I would say that uh, I think there are some, some things that are, that are moving in the right direction. Uh, we see this through different consortia that the understanding of, of pre-competitive uh, is really being expanded. I think we as companies, uh, companies together with academia so are becoming better and better at expanding what, what that encompasses. I'm hoping that we can keep on moving in that direction, so making data available. Uh, so, so that would be my my final remark, uh, both as a as a sponsor and as a as a trialist, but also as a medical doctor, and finally as a as a father to a small daughter with a rare disease. I really encourage that that we can continue to share data. Thank you very much. Um, thanks very much, Mods. Really appreciate the comments. And uh, next is uh, a tool. Uh, hello, hi, hi. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be on the panel today. Uh, I'm a team leader in the Division of Pharmacometrics, Office of Clinical Pharmacology, FDA. Um, I'm here to share my perspectives on data sharing, harmonization, and utility of modeling approaches to maximize learning in rare diseases. I must also say that FDA is very interested in uh, improving efficiency of rare disease clinical trials and hearing the presentations from day one and also today the presentation from Jane, I think a lot of progress is being made these days to understand um, the trajectories of uh, progression in individual patients and then understanding uh, what are the, what is the influence of uh, genetic factors and standard of care uh, and ultimately tying all these uh, endpoints into designing efficient clinical trials. So I think a lot of progress is being made um, based on what I see from publications from from groups within uh, United States, groups like MD Starnet, Synergy, especially in the area of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and also groups from Europe. And it's good to and at the agency, we also see the learnings from all these analysis when, when clinical study protocols are submitted, where uh, portions around uh, control groups, uh, inclusion, exclusion criteria are often discussed. Uh, so I think a lot of progress is being made. And I think the common theme, what I hear, what I heard from yesterday and today also is that uh, efficient ways of sharing data, um, doing a doing a thorough job with the data, conducting the analysis, and importantly, I think, sharing among the community and then the researchers in a timely manner, I think, is going to take these initiatives uh, into, into like, whereby the clinical trials, I think, can be designed uh, much more efficiently. So I look forward to the discussion. Uh, Atul, thanks very much for those comments. And it, it, it does seem like we've heard a lot about the benefits, as you were just saying, of, of these efforts to, to share data and some clear impacts on making uh, trials more efficient. 
Um, I would like to remind people if they have a, a comment that they'd like to raise uh, for this part of our open discussion, uh, please put it uh, in the chat box. If you feel a little bit embarrassed about sending a, a chat to all, just send it to one of our Duke Margolis uh, co-hosts and we can get it into the discussion. But uh, we, we definitely do want to hear from you. Um, I think we have a few uh, uh, discussion topics that maybe we could put up on the, the, the screen at this point. Um, uh, as well. Um, but I'd like to get started with uh, a question about what you all see uh, on the panel as uh, some of the most important opportunities to expand access to, to data. Um, so a, a lot of this may be um, uh, require some collection from individual patients and individual centers, but we do have, um, you know, Mods mentioned the use of uh, data that have al already been uh, developed as, as part of uh, sponsor uh, uh, protocols and prior studies. Um, we also heard a bit from several of you about the use of electronic health record uh, information. Um, Jane, maybe I go back to you to um, uh, maybe some comments on where the, uh, the best uh, data opportunities uh, seem to be. Absolutely. This is something we've been thinking about a lot as we seek data for the RDCA DAP. And I think a lot of our history at CPATH has been working with high quality clinical trial data that's very rigorously collected in a very defined way. But in rare diseases, we need every piece of data we can get. There are so few patients, depending on the disease, we need all kinds of data. Um, we've been using data from patient registries, which is very different than data from clinical trials or organized natural history studies. And we're look, beginning to look into other sort of real, more real world data, data types, like can we get useful information from electronic health records? We've certainly used clinical registries before. The challenge as you get into some of these, whether it's wearables or electronic health records, is it's not going to be as standardized. It's not going to be put into standard formalized elements. They may not be collecting defined outcome assessments or biomarkers. So you've got to really understand how to interpret that data and use that data alongside other data, data sets and data forms. So there are lots of questions that we're still working on in terms of curation and standardization, but the data is incredibly valuable. And I don't know if Vanessa from Nord is still on the line, but she can certainly talk, talk to some of the work we've been doing with some of their IAM rare databases and figuring out what we can do with a patient report registry particularly in conjunction with clinical data to really move things forward. Yeah, Vanessa, if you've got a comment or anyone else uh, um, uh, participating on, on that, that'd be great. Also would like to hear from the, the rest of the panel on the same question, if you all have any uh, thoughts to add to Jane's comments. I, I can maybe make a comment sort of reflecting on own experience, but looking at sort of what is really the the chain of events that needs to take place in order to share the data right there's of course there's knowledge around the opportunity for some institution sponsors there may be a resource element i mean it's um, it's there's a lot of, of work on the recipient end but there's also some degree of work if you own the data as a, as a data owner you know there is you know protocol needs to be redacted and supplied in order for the data to be meaningful they need to be anonymized and so forth. So there are some, there is some work related to it. I think if, if platforms, institutions either can support that or there's, you know, public funding or, you know, whatever for, for some institution that, that could be a help. Then there is uh, obviously the, the platform and, and that, that, that Jane was showing. So the tools that go together with it. So if for the institutions or for sponsors that, that, that you know can really see the benefit. I think you you showed these really nice uh, user friendly opportunities for for, for modeling around Duchenne. Th these are really good examples of 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 you can say the the full value of not just sharing but also leveraging uh, the data. And then finally, uh, of course, there is a pre planning element in terms of standardizing data. But I'm also hoping that as technology advances, that we'll be better able to work with non standardized data. Right. So also working. You know, you know, conjointly to, to, to enable, you know, supplying less standardized data. I'm not saying not to standardize, of course, that's where we are today, but the hope is that technology and, 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 and preparational standardization can work together uh, and, and allow you to work with an even wider set of, of data types of quality. 
Great, thank you for, for that overview. And Mods, while I've got you, maybe don't go off video just yet, but uh, you've actually been part of, uh, been, been doing what you what you advocated, which is as a sponsor sharing data from um, some of your uh, uh, trials and, and, and other activities as part of CPAD and, and the like. Could you comment a little bit on how that's gone and, and what uh, other sponsors uh, might, uh, uh, might think about in, in making a similar kind of uh, decision to commit to sharing data? Yeah, thanks for, thanks for asking. Um, I, I think it has really been sort of in the, in the collaboration with, with CPAS, and I, I'm, I'm not just saying this to flatter, but it has been a surprisingly collaborative effort with, with great degree of support. I think the main obstacles, and some may even remain, is around sort of uh, GDPR data, anonymization, uh, contracting different partners. Uh, that goes, that's quite degree, that's probably been the biggest job, uh, is, is sort of contracting the relevant parties to, to have the data anonymized and protocols redacted and all of that. I think that has been the main obstacle, but the, surely the obstacle has not been on the recipient side or the platform side of CPAS, so the collaboration there has been great. I think, and maybe this is a sponsor thing, but of course uh, it required a little bit of massaging internally because uh, data are value. I think it's probably what companies own that carries the most value. It's the IP around the data. Uh, so, you know, so, so massaging that and maybe moving the needle a little bit in terms of that. But I, as I was saying also in my uh, panel remark, I, I think we're seeing, I think the industry as a whole uh, is really helped by this movement around transparency, uh, pre-competitive collaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not there where we, we are not where we want to be yet. Uh, I don't think we can say that, but I, I think I see some good movements uh, in this regard. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, I do want to come back to so sponsor data that's been you know clearly curated and been part of an FDA submission. I understand the value in that, and I appreciate the the comments about how uh, facilitating viewing this as a pre-competitive um, uh, issue that that yes does include some value, but but can benefit all and and uh, uh, still retain some proprietary advantages for the company. That, that seems like a, a good path forward for those sources of data. I want to come back to electronic health records though, because that, you know, that is information that's increasingly available um, through uh, this direct electronic exchange. Um, but maybe uh, if any of the panelists would care to comment about their experience on how easy that is to use at a larger scale. So, you know, uh, we, we talked about CDISC standards before. There's a lot of information in electronic records that is supposed to be captured uh, according to standards. There's a lot that's free text or images and, and so forth. Um, how easy is it to, to use electronic health record data from a, from a technical standpoint uh, in, in these efforts? You know, Jane, Rebecca, if uh, if you all care to, to comment on that. <laughs> sure, I can, I can comment. I'm sure Rebecca can as well. Of course, it is not as easy to use that sort of unstructured data as it is to use um, the, stru the structured data. I think with um, the, um, some of the fire principles and things coming, up, coming on board, as they start to standardize electronic health records more, there'll be more that we can gain out of it. We, we as yet haven't used un um, uncurated electronic health records, but our platform architect is very interested in it. She seems to think we can derive useful information from it. I do know, at least in the Duchenne field where I've looked into it, a lot of the important information is kept as free text notes, and that's certainly going to be harder to extract. So I would say a work in progress, but particularly as standards are developed, it's going to become more and more useful and a very valuable source of data. So, Rebecca? Mm -hmm. I know uh, you're on mute, just a reminder. Sorry about that. Um, I, I'm in alignment with Jane. Right now, Vifly has not tapped that source. I, I think clinical trial data, as you know, is, is very structured, um, but we have not yet tapped that because it, it is right now in terms of the, the standards is not quite there yet. Thanks. And, and Mike, I don't know if you had a comment on this. I know you had a, a, a question to pose, so uh, either or both would be uh, uh, fine at this point. Yeah, well, yeah, okay. So I'll comment on the second one that as it related to dbGaP. So we are exploring um, providing the dbGaP in the FHIR protocols. Um, so we're, we're actively pursuing that. That would be 
outgoing would be fire, especially for the phenotypic data. A lot of the data in dbGaP, some of the very large genomic data, um, literally petabytes of data, are going to really only be practical to be used on the cloud. Um, we believe that we can um, probably uh, serve an API with the fire protocols for the phenotypic exposure and uh, demographic data pretty easily. Um, I do have another question if, if we have time. Yes, please. And, it, and, it, and I put it on the on the um, panelists chat, but it it has to do with a problem we see in dbGaP in our research studies. There's about three million or so patients in dbGaP as well, um, but we do see a fair number of our studies that are independently funded at NIH usually um, that are using the same participants, and this isn't just Framingham being reused. Um, these are um, sometimes uh, studies uh, are located in places where um, there's a, you know, there, people sign up for different research studies and we, we end up getting these studies. dbGaP has the advantage of having, in most cases, the genomic data. And so we can actually identify these pretty readily when they do occur. But I imagine this problem could be uh, a real problem if there were multiple data sources, completely different data sources sharing data across their platforms without some kind of coordination of the participants, because in rare diseases, you're gonna have a lot fewer. And if, yeah. if you think that there's 100 and there's really only 50, <laughs> that, could, that makes a big power yeah. problem on your calculations. Yeah, anyway. definitely. Um, Rebecca or Jane, you wanna comment on that? Sure, and this really comes back to some of the discussion we had yesterday about global identifiers and GUIDs, because of course, as we bring our data and it's all de-identified, and at the moment we're not getting genomic data, although we hope to in the future, so a lot of the time we can't guarantee we're not getting the same patient or identify that patient A is the same as patient Z, it's just a matter of what uh, we have to accept that the patients are the patients that we have right now, but that's why we're so keenly interested in the GUID question so that there's some kind of global identifier or some way of tracking back that that's actually the same person and we can include all the data from that same person. Um, I know, for example, in our Friedrichs Ataxia data that um, um, at least one, one, of, one of my friends was in that database a couple of times, but I couldn't find which his entry was and match them up by any chance. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, one of the goals to keep this de-identified right, um, obviously the best GUID is your genomic uh, profile. Um, I'm, I'm curious, I, I hear this term GUID being thrown around, but in most cases they seem to be, you know, a, a unique identifier within that one system. Um, coordinating this across systems is going to be really difficult, I guess. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, if I may jump in, this is Klaus. Uh, I, I can't start my video for some reason, but um, oh, here we go. Okay, so uh, the, the, that's a really good question, but it, it is not impossible to do. Uh, in Certainly in clinical trials, and let me just make that exception, clinical trials from industry with the mandate of CETA standards from the FDA, that includes uh, global user IDs across the board, across uh, diseases, across companies, and that is happening, and we're seeing it in the, in the data we're, we're getting transferred. That's one bucket of solution, but that doesn't mean that it cannot be done elsewhere. Uh, Huntington's disease, a rare condition, is a, is a great example of that, where that community embraced that concept uh, a number of years ago even, and the data we're integrating in Huntington's disease has uh, global unique uh, identifiers from a standpoint back in time when that was adopted, not, not all the way back to um, you know, the distant past, but when that was adopted, we, th they do have these uh, global unique identifiers across uh, studies, even observational studies, not from, not from pharma. So it is doable. Uh, the, the example that, that Jane was describing in, in Duchesne is one in which we're pushing to have that be adopted learning from, from Huntington's. But in reality, the, what we are seeing, and, it, and a tool can comment on this as well, 
is that uh, the, the real impact of not being able to identify a, a subject that participates in multiple studies, at least for the solutions that we're building, has to do with an artificial shrinkage in the, in the remaining uncertainty. So the, the, the remaining uh, error, it gets artificially shrunk. And there are uh, proven methods by, through which you can handle that artificial shrinkage. So you can, you can adjust, yes, it's not ideal, but you can even then, in, in, with that limitation, there are ways to uh, adjust for that. Uh, thanks, Klaus. Um, a tool, um, since Klaus mentioned it, do you want to comment on this? Is this something that FDA has seen much in, in submissions? And is there a uh, kind of an acceptable way to deal with it along the lines that Klaus was describing? Uh, can I make one comment on the electronic health records and also this sure. question? Um, I, I'm speaking mostly from 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 our research experience with uh, with the data from MD Starnet and CDC, especially for uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. I think uh, if the EHR electronic health records or information is gathered well, I think it's they are very useful to understand. Uh, potential uh, reasons for sources of variability. And at least what I have seen is in the area of, for example, like Duchenne muscular dystrophy, understanding uh, when people get onto steroids, when do they stop taking steroids, what are the reasons, and how they manage the condition. Uh, I think all those things are very important uh, to understand when trials are being done in small groups of subjects. Uh, because what we want to avoid is too much of variability in clinical trials, which makes it harder to detect any treatment effect, uh, especially given the size of available patient population and also if uh, multiple sponsors are developing drugs for uh, for the similar indication. So I just want to mention that uh, if the electronic health records can be extracted well and then the information presented to the researchers in a very simple manner, I think, is a very powerful tool towards uh, improving efficiency in these clinical trials. Yeah, yeah, that, that topic definitely came up uh, yesterday as well. And I, I did want to have a little bit of a follow up on, on that and on using, um, bringing these data together more generally in terms of standards. But um, Klaus, I think you got it in the chat, but uh, there, there was some interest in um, which algorithm you were actually describing. So uh, just making sure that um, uh, everybody knows how to, how to find it. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking about the, the CDIS construct uh, for, for uh, unique subject IDs, uh, which is something that, like I said, I mean, it's, it's a mandate for, for clinical trials, but it has been adopted outside of, of clinical trials. And one example in rare diseases where this has been in place for a number of years now is Huntington's disease, and I, I mean, you've got my contact information. I'd be happy to uh, follow up with with materials and references, etc. Great, uh, th thanks very much. And um, let me ask a, a question. Does this come up in some of the chat too uh, about um, uh, appropriate standards here? Um, uh, several of you referenced uh, fire, at least for uh, interoperability, and uh, there were also. Um, I think, um, uh, Jane, you talked about uh, CDIS standards being used in, uh, in, in, in your approach. Uh, where are we on uh, standards adoption? Uh, uh, FHIR is getting a lot of attention and a lot of adoption for promoting interoperability. Um, but as you all know, the goal here isn't just sharing the data, but having it sort of consistently defined enough to support analytics. Um, uh, how are we doing in terms of FHIR standards versus CDISC or, or other approaches to, to uh, address that? I think a lot of that discussion is going to come back to the definition of standards because different standards for different purposes doesn't mean one makes another redundant. And I was very interested to hear the person from CDISC talking about developing interoperability guidelines to translate FHIR into CDISC because of course, um, there's value to both. And I like the fact that FHIR is a guideline for how to structure electronic health records. CDISC, of course, is a very formalized structure, which is very useful for integrating data and comparing different data sets, which is why we use it. So uh, there are a number of different standards out there and we're exploring them all, but definitely understanding which one is best for which purpose and making them as interoperable as possible and be able to translate data from one to the other as much as possible. 
without, I think it was Mike who made the point earlier of losing information as you do it or garbling the information um, as, you, as you go. So there's a lot of work still to be done there, but it's a very in interesting and very important area. And so, so I, I get the point about um, uh, making sure you got the right standards for the right um, uses, but going back to the point that a tool made about wanting to see more use of electronic health record data and uh, the point that several of you made about the, the challenges in um, you know, unstructured fields or, or, or lack of full um, standardization, at least to the support that kind of high uh, quality analysis that you're used to with a, a, like a trial uh, protocol data set. Um, what's the path forward there? Does the, do the fire standards help with bringing the data in? Is there then still going to be some additional work to get um, to the level of, of standardization that you'd see for um, sort of a CDS type structure? Um, how, how do we move forward on getting more electronic health record information and in, given uh, all the attention around fire standards there? Yeah, I think there's a juxtaposition there and some balancing and this comes from conversations as much with clinicians as anything else where we, the data people, would love every, every electronic health, or, um, health record to be incredibly structured so it was easy to bring the data in and collect exactly the same thing every time in a structured way. And then the clinicians say, but we like having open text where we can describe things, describe things in our own language, notes to help us remember other things. And I think some clinicians are very good at filling in the more structured forms, some, some perhaps not. And I think we need to find the balance between keeping health records in a way where this data that can be standardized is being standardized, but there's still some leeway for that more personal clinical approach for keeping track of the things that perhaps aren't part of a standardized form. And I think FIRE has gone a long way to structuring what can be structured. And that's a good step in the right direction. It needs to be adopted more, used more, and we probably need to spend more time looking at that data and seeing where the gaps are. Great. And since we're still on the subject of standards, uh, uh, John Birch asked about um, OMOP and whether um, OMOP-based uh, data can map easily into these, um, into Jane, into approaches like yours that are based on CDIS standards. Uh, do you have all, do you all have any experience in that, either Jane or um, Rebecca or others? Sounds like maybe not with uh, OMOP. I, I'm sitting here thinking, I know we've talked about this, but our platform architect's the person who looked into it and I don't have the details. So. Okay, so uh, maybe a good one for, for follow-up as well. Um, want to talk a little bit about, so we've talked a lot about data standards and sources of data. Um, maybe we could expand a, a little bit on some of the issues around um, database management, especially with the goal of approaches that can be uh, disease agnostic, kind of the, related to the, the second question here. Um, and maybe Rebecca, could I, could I turn to you on that one for, I know you, you, you dealt with this in, in your comments, um, but maybe a, a little bit more on advice, guidance for um, uh, putting data together in a way that, that can be repeated for, for more um, rare diseases. Yeah, of course. I mean, there are so many challenges, right? Um, and and what we're seeing are a couple a couple different challenges. I mean, specifically some of the things, and maybe not going to your second part of your question, but the first part of the question, a few of the challenges that we are seeing in terms of operational considerations are um, are the data quality uh, tends to be uh, a little bit uneven. Um, and, you know, one thing that Jane had mentioned is um, the variables are not always mapped. You know, we, we sometimes, um, people ask for, for data from different contributors, and of course the variables are, are mapped differently. Um, we also see some, one of the operational considerations is that the anonymization scheme tends to be, to be different from different members. So if one contributor chooses one anonymization scheme, and another chooses another, um, especially for small data sets, um, that can make a big difference. And those are, that's one of the operational considerations um, that really is, uh, has a big impact on, on, the, um, on the investigator. And so the, those are the challenges. In terms of the platform tools, um, some of the things that we are 
really wrestling with are that people are asking for imaging and genomics, and each one of those requires specific tools. And as a disease agnostic platform, those are things that we have to wrestle with is what are we going to invest in next um, for our next you know, big investment. Some uh, good, uh, some important challenges. Um, any comments from other panelists or others about this issue of um, uh, making, uh, adopting approaches that are as uh, disease agnostic as possible to help generalize these methods, but recognizing, as Rebecca just described, the unique um, data needs uh, disease by disease? Mike? Yeah, well. <laughs> I can tell you how we approached that problem years ago when we first started. Um, we modeled um, dbGaP so that it essentially models a rectangular table with, uh, and then there's an associated data dictionary. The rectangular table where rows are people or people time points and the columns are our variables or in these can be exposure or demographic or clinical variables on a person. Uh, we do the same at the subject level or the sample level as well. Um, we found that for at least our research submitters um, to be the most flexible. Now when we, we ingest that we obviously normalize that to um, a relational type database um, in, in our system. Um, our hope is that we would because we've normalized it in our system, we can um, disseminate that data in a number of formats. And, and the, right now, the, the table format is, is the one that's most used by our users, but we are, we are developing the, the fire output for format for the phenotypic data, at least. Thanks. Uh, Rebecca, did you want to comment on this? No, that, that's a, a helpful way to think about it. And, you know, we have, um, fairly little control about how data comes into us, but I think that's really helpful as one way to put forward as a potential uh, solution. So thanks, Mike. Great, thank you. And again, I want to encourage people to use the chat box if they've got any questions or, or comments that they'd like to make sure we include, uh, or uh, just uh, raising your hand and, and uh, we'll, we'll try to get to you. Um, I was going to shift gears a little bit and go on to the third question, issues related to data protection, intellectual property concerns. Those get to some of the governance topics that many of you all have talked about already, which do seem critical for inspiring uh, participation and, and uh, uh, useful output from, uh, from these efforts. Um, uh, several of you brought up topics like um, GDPR, uh, like um, managing consent um, uh, and, and uh, pr proprietary issues uh, around data sharing. Um, we, we appreciate some more comments around um, guidance on governance for, uh, for these um, uh, data sharing um, platforms and, and strategies. Um, uh, I know, Jane, do you want to you start on that one? Sure, happy, happy to start on that one. It's certainly going to be a, a challenge that we're working on all the time. In fact, we've had a very successful method for sharing data with the community at CPATH for a long time, which goes back to individual data sharing agreements, database by database, where the contributor can come, can let us know how we can share the data, what we can do with it whether we need to have it reviewed through a steering committee, whether you can just, everyone can have access to it, whether you can use it for specific purposes or not. And that's been very successful over time, but it does not get at the earlier stage issues, whether the pa patients were consented to, um, gave consent to share. We only ever look at the identified or anonymized data, so that helps, but under GDPR, there are still some concerns there of moving data, particularly from Europe to the US. And we're working through some solutions there. There's a lot of work more that needs to be done. In terms of the uh, what will make people more comfortable to share, we're actually about to launch a series of focus groups with various stakeholder groups to really understand the concerns with data sharing, what we need to bake into the rare, rare disease cures accelerator, data and analytics platform, data sharing agreement to really optimize how easy it is for patient, people to share data with us. And at the other end, to still make it easy for people to use the data and access the data. Because you can imagine somebody comes in and asks for five data sets for different disease areas. You can't go through five different steering committees and ask 50 different people for permission. That's not a usable solution if you want to really make the data available. 
So those are the sorts of thing, issues we're working at the moment is where is that balance between what people are willing to do to allow their data to be shared and made available and at the other end, whether um, making it truly available to the community for research. Are there, um, based on that experience, I realize it's a complex and ongoing set of issues, uh, any best practices or when you're working with your participating um, your participating sites, uh, um, uh, advice that you give them about how to manage consent on their end and, and how to convey uh, to their participants uh, the, the level of uh, kind of privacy and confidentiality that you're going to maintain? Yeah, there's actually ongoing conversations um, around I, uh, optimized consent forms for data sharing and our, our Alzheimer's consortium put out a paper a couple of years ago about the appropriate language for secondary data sharing, which unfortunately was made outdated almost immediately by the passing of GDPR. So we need to get, get to our publishing an updated version. But generally, even under GDPR, data sharing is okay so long as the patient, when they consent, understand, yes, this data may be shared. Yes, that includes with industry. Yes, your data may leave whatever country you're in and be used internationally. It really is a series of checkboxes to make sure the patient understands what they're allowing their data to be to be used for. And if they agree to that, that's great. You can use the data. And I know there are several registry platforms that are looking at more dynamic ways of doing that, which is a bit more challenging for data integration programs like us, where it's easier if the whole database is consented or the whole database is not. But there are definitely good best practices around the language to use in consent. And then we make things as easy as possible at the other end in terms of terms and conditions of using the data to make sure people are promising not to re-identify the data, to treat the data with appropriate data privacy as we would, and various other terms and conditions like that to make sure people can safely and securely use the data without compromising the concerns and the security. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wonder if there are other comments from panelists on, uh, on best practices around uh, um, encouraging but providing appropriate oversight on how this kind of data sharing. Mike? Well, I don't know if this is appropriate and it's it's probably, it's a practice, I want best practice, but uh, H has done quite a bit of work on this um, as part of EDS policy, and that's all available on the websites, and you can see that, but essentially there's a data um, submission certification that's submitted by the uh, sponsoring institute and signed by the PI and, and a signing official and they um, categorize their subjects that they're submitting into uh, one or more consent groups for study. And those consent groups have data use limitations for, for which the, the data can be used. And then each request to comp is part of a project, uh, it can be multiple data sets, but the project contains a research use statement. And the, um, the data access request is, is evaluated by NIH data access committee um, that the submission certification uh, grants um, uh, permission to approve or deny based on the research use statement matching the data use limitations of the data set. Um, it's a model. It's, um, it's not every, it's not a hundred tax, it's, but it's something like 20. <laughs> and so there's, there's 20 slightly different takes on, on the, the guidance around that, but it's standardized in the fact that there's OMB forms to make the request and to, um, and to, uh, to receive approval. Great, um, thanks. And, and Mods, um, maybe I could, uh, could, could you comment a bit on the extent of which from the standpoint of a sponsor data set, uh, these issues of, um, uh, consent need to be addressed or are being addressed uh, to, to what extent is that an issue that could be slowing down um, uh, data sharing across sponsors and are there best practices to to address that yeah I'm happy to uh, mark and I actually think Jane covered it very nicely I think in our case it simply was a tick box that we were fortunate with was ticked uh, you know if it hadn't been we would it would really have been a, a roadblock so I think the work around it, you know, actually implementing it 
practically for clinical trials and consent forms is pretty easy and straightforward. But obviously you need to know in advance uh, and have the most updated uh, view on how to, to, to word those. But in our case, we were lucky because the, the way it was organized enabled that to happen. So, uh, so it, it, it's getting that insight and then getting it implemented. And I think, you know, would encourage all sponsors to do it for all consent forms, right? Uh, sure. Is your sense that that's, is that pretty common practice uh, yet among sponsors or is that something that, that you know, the, the groups that are represented here today could, uh, could take back and, and encourage as, as their uh, members um, participate in, in trials? Yeah, it could be a good, that would be a relevant topic for, you know, for the pharma for, I, I honestly, I, it would be stretching my knowledge to say I have an overview of that. Maybe there are sponsors present that can comment, but it's certainly something that we are aware of. Okay, great. Um, we are um, running short on time. It's been an excellent discussion. For those of you who are interested in this issue of overlapping subjects and identifying individuals and methods to address that, um, I'm not going to have time to go into it here. It is a, a very uh, lively dialogue in the in the chat box about uh, about how to do so and some of the uh, important work that's been done. Um, a, a tool I wanted to, to come back to you be, before we finished uh, around um, you know your comments about the, the value of these kinds of um, uh, data sharing efforts for um, improving the efficiency of trials. Um, based on what you've heard or anything else you'd like to add, um, are there some steps that, uh, that FDA uh, is taking or, or could take to help advance the, the harmonization and participation in, in these uh, data sharing efforts? Yeah, so uh, based on my experience, uh, I mean, we have been encouraging sponsors to share data to, to so that uh, we can maximize the learning. And I just want to mention, like, for example, one of the slides that uh, Jane had where, where all the data from several clinical trials for Duchenne have been collected, I think it, I'm sure that is being done for other, other uh, conditions also. Uh, I think once once uh, the researchers and the community have a good understanding of all the data that is available, and the data is shared across uh, across platforms, I think then we can figure out what is the missing information and then uh, generate that, uh, so that we have a complete understanding of how to design clinical trials, and uh, and improve the efficiency. So I think yes, the agency has been encouraging. Uh, companies to share the data and then uh, and then uh, and then maximize the learning. Great, uh, uh, thanks very much, Atul, and thanks for all that FDA is doing in this area. Um, we'd like to uh, we just have a, a, a couple of minutes left, but we would like to turn to our uh, other panelists, starting with Jane, for whether they have any final points they'd like to add about uh, key ideas for advancing uh, the, the efforts we've just been discussing. Thank you. I think the discussion has been great here, and I think it's really actually pulled together a number of things. I have a poster, a poster beside me of different areas where I think as a community we really need to be pull, uh, pulling together. And that, that was started before this meeting, but I think this meeting has really um, cemented the fact that as a community we need to have discussions over the uh, um, optimal consent forms to allow for data sharing. We need to come to agreement on what is acceptable for data government, governance. We need to have more discussions about standards for different types of data and making sure that they're all interoperable. And really, we also need to have conversations between all of these data, different data sharing platforms to make sure that the utility of the data is optimized for the various purposes we have and look at, look at possibilities of moving data and sharing data between the platforms as well as within platforms. So I think this has been a great discussion, but we've got lots and lots of work still to be done to really optimize what we can do with existing data. Yeah, and, and, thank thank you much. and thank you for helping to move it forward. Uh, Rebecca, any uh, final comments? Uh, sorry, I was just unmuting. Um, yeah, you know, I was thinking just a bit about the gaps and where data is not being shared clearly. Um, you know, pharma is sharing a great deal, but you know, the biotechs are not sharing all that much, I'll be honest with you. And there are certain diseases where data is being shared. It's clear in Duchenne, uh, there's quite a bit of data being shared, but other rare diseases, almost none at all as, as we're seeing it. So I think really uh, looking at the gaps, getting those patient 
communities involved. So what we're seeing on the ground is when the patient community is engaged, that data becomes shared. Um, so I really think getting those patient communities engaged and, and maybe putting some pressure in some ways uh, would get that data shared because uh, really we're seeing some isolated pockets of data sharing in, in many, many areas. You know, there, there have been a number of uh, very specific ways in which uh, patient groups can uh, help advance these efforts that we've talked about during, uh, during this session. So, th so thanks for, for highlighting that. Uh, Mike, any final comment? Uh, well, I did have a question, but I think uh, I'm afraid it would take too long to get, had to do with the out of these databases for clinical trials. Like clinicaltrials.gov have the trials uh, registered as in existence in, in enrollment. And then also there's a requirement, I believe, to submit the data there. Uh, these databases would be somewhere in between those two steps. and. It seems to me like analytical tools that would provide a ingestible format for clinical trials to use directly would be uh, an, an interesting uh, thing to understand. Yeah, uh, thanks for thanks for um, addressing that. And mods. Yeah, nothing much more to add. It's really want to, to thank for, for being part of this. It has been you know, truly interesting and also with the prior sessions, we're looking forward to the rest of the day. And I just echo that I really want to appeal to, to other sponsors to share the data. It's really, you know, it's really how we drive productivity uh, within this tremendously important field for patients and, and, and for, so thanks a lot. All right, well, thank you. And, and my thanks as well to the rest of the panel for uh, excellent discussions and, and perspectives. Uh, we are gonna take a, a short break now. Um, we're we're going to reconvene at 2.45 uh, Eastern time if you're following the agenda and look forward to our, uh, our next panel at that point. Thank you all very much for joining and for contributing to a very lively discussion in this session. All right, welcome back everyone. We are live again as uh, we, we continue our sessions this afternoon. Um, before I move on to session five on collaborative research networks, I just wanna thank everyone again who's contributed to the, the chat box. Um, uh, it gives us a, a chance to get more ideas out there, your ideas, uh, in a way we may not get full time to discuss in the session itself. Uh, uh, for example, I'd like to uh, give a thanks to, to Megan for uh, her post about how Rare X, uh, with website included, is addressing the need for standardization across rare diseases. Uh, symptoms and um, as well and federated uh, data sharing and analysis. So we want to encourage more of that. It's been a lively chat so far. Uh, when you do post, if you could post to uh, all panelists and attendees, uh, so all panelists and attendees, that's, that gives you the, the broadest reach um, to uh, everyone who's, who's joining us today. Um, but for those of you who, were, who didn't get the, the, the post about uh, uh, rarex.org, it's uh, rare-x.org, uh, also uh, doing some important work um, in this area. And again, we want uh, more uh, chat contributions uh, like this that help us get the most out of this time together. For those of you who do want to send uh, just a, a question or something you'd like us to address in the panel discussion, uh, you can still send that directly to one of our uh, Duke Margolis uh, uh, co-hosts, co Mira Kelly, uh, uh, Sarah. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So I would like to turn to session five now on collaborative research networks to support rare disease drug development. We're gonna to continue to explore how shared data resources are being leveraged to support preclinical and clinical research in rare diseases. In this session, we're gonna talk about uh, research consortia uh, that are well positioned to support preclinical research in rare diseases and how clinical trial networks can streamline and make clinical data collection for rare diseases more efficient. So not topics that are new to this meeting, uh, but uh, some new uh, and deeper perspectives uh, on them. Uh, and again, uh, use the chat function 
uh, the chat box or, uh, during the session or email us at rd.data at duke.edu if you've got a comment or question you'd like to make sure we address in the open part of uh, this session. Uh, so I'm very pleased to introduce our speakers uh, for this session. Uh, first, Eileen King is Principal Investigator of the um, RDCRN Data Management and Coordinating Center at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Uh, she's going to do our initial presentation. Uh, and then our reactants include Klaus Romero, Chief Science Officer at Critical Path Institute, uh, you heard from uh, during the last session, uh, Nicole Hamblett, uh, Co-Executive Director of the Cystic Fibrosis Therapeutics Development Network Coordinating Center at Seattle Children's Research Institute, uh, Ian Winburn, uh, who's a global medical team lead for hemophilia, endocrine, inborn errors of metabolism and transportation at Pfizer, and Dina Zahn, who's medical officer in the Division of Rare Diseases and Medical Genetics at FDA. And so we're going to start with uh, Eileen, so I'd like to turn over to you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, thanks everyone for inviting me, and this has been an incredibly interesting um, workshop these last two days, so I'm, I'm so thrilled to be part of this. Um, as was stated, um, I am one of two of the principal investigators for the Data Management Coordinating Center for the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network. And if you were with us yesterday, um, you heard Tina Err, who is our program officer from NIH, um, and she gave some background on the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network as well. Um, next slide. Um, in, in the spirit of sharing, um, Tina and I have a couple of the same slides here, but this is a, an overview of what the structure of the, the uh, Clinical Research Network is, RDCRN. Um, and, uh, it is me. Eileen, sorry to interrupt. We're, uh, you're having a little bit of fuzziness in your sound. I don't know if there's a way to adjust the, the microphone to make it a little bit clearer, um, but... Uh, um, is this any better? A little bit, maybe. I think the closer you can oh. get probably helps. I'm not sure how easy that is. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, that's better. That is better. That, is that better there? Yeah. Okay, let me know if I need to adjust again. Okay. Okay. So this is the uh, RDCRN is made up of 20 um, research consortia. Um, on five-year funding cycles. Uh, so some of the consortia will get refunded um, on each five-year cycle, up to, I believe it's three cycles this time. Um, it is uh, funded, there are 10 NIH partners who are funding the RDCRN, and we are the data management and coordinating center that supports uh, the um, RDCRN. As was stated yesterday, the RDCRN is made up of patients and patient advocacy groups, researchers and clinicians, and the NIH. Next slide. I want to talk about the individual consortia. Um, so the research consortia, um, each research, each consortia studies at least three related rare diseases. And the consortia are structured such that they have an administrative core. They were to propose at least three clinical research projects. One of the projects is required to be a natural history study. Uh, for each of the studies that they do, starting in this particular cycle, they all had to um, be, they all had to have a single IRB for each protocol. And for this particular funding mechanism, no phase three studies are allowed. However, as I'm learning, allowed. And uh, Eileen, we're having, a, I think, a little bit of trouble with your sound. Um, are you still with us? They are in the next generation of rare disease researchers, so they all have to have a career enhancement core. Eileen, sorry, you're, you're breaking up and we lost you for a while. Can you call in oh. via your phone or something? 
Um, I think that either the phone or one thing you could try, Eileen, is turning off the video and just uh, just going with sound. We're, we're mainly watching the slides anyway. Um, that might. Oh, help. I'm sorry. And okay. With, Mm, is this even, that goes. If you want to turn down the speakers on your computer in your room, it may help with some of the fuzziness of the sound on our end as well. Okay. Yeah, lots is of this, adjustments. Is this any better? That's a little better, yeah. Okay, you want me to call in on my phone? I'm sorry. No problem. Yeah, I think we, I, can move, we, we can move forward. We can hear you well and, and uh, um, yeah, I think without, we can go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. Um, the one thing I did uh, forget to, to mention as I was introducing uh, myself is I did work for 20 years in the pharmaceutical industry um, prior to joining Cincinnati Children's and I've now been 11 years at uh, Cincinnati Children's in academia. So I have seen both sides of um, the research process. Are you hearing me okay this time? Yeah, yes, perfect. please go ahead. Okay, next slide. The DMCC is structured such that it has four cores. We have an administrative core, clinical research core, a data management core, and an engagement and dissemination core. Um, next slide. Bill, uh, click again. So we, you can go ahead and click all four, or two more. So the administrative core, <coughs> excuse me, we, uh, we support cross, uh, the cross consortia um, activities. So we have to support meetings, etc. But one of the other things is we try to um, to make sure that we have best practices going across um, the, all the RDCRN. And we also are working on standardizing processes as well. <clears throat> Our clinical research core is really focused on the pro supporting the protocols and um, and providing guidance and expertise with protocols because it's important that, that the studies are conducted such that you do get high quality data that are shareable. So we provide a regulatory guidance and single IRB support. We have our stat statisticians and epidemiologists look at the study design and analysis. And especially key is we get involved very early on the design of the data collection forms where we are really striving to um, implement data standards in these data collection forms um, with, a, with a focus on uh, CDIS standards. And then also in the back of our mind, um, we're looking at how we might use FHIR standards as well. And we provide training across disease agnostic training, especially with related to how do you, do you, how do you write good protocols, et cetera. Our data management core is involved with um, cloud-based data collection and storage. How, what are we gonna, where are we gonna store and how are we gonna store all these data so that we can share them within our network? Um, focusing on data sharing, as we've talked about data standards and data access dissemination and utilization. We have a fourth core, which is new. This funding cycle is an engagement and dissemination core and understanding the importance of having patients and their families involved in the research process um, it is really important to the RDCRN. We want the patients and families not only engaged in recruiting patients for our studies, and not only engaged in advertising our studies, but also engaged in helping us understand what are the most important questions to be asked from the research. What are the most important outcomes that are meaningful to the patients and might be sensitive to, um, to identify a treatment success? And then the other key component of this core is promotion and outreach. And this is, we wanna make sure that the public, that the, uh, that the physicians who are treating these patients are understanding what we're learning from our rare disease research. And so that's also a very important component of the DMCC. Next slide. We always keep our mind on, um, on our goal. And our main goal is to improve the health and wellness of patients with rare diseases and their families, knowing that 
that when someone has a rare disease, it affects not only them, but it affects those who are, who are near and dear to them, their families, their parents, their siblings, etc. Two ways that have been identified, of course, how can we, um, can we reach this goal? You want to have faster diagnosis of these, these patients um, as to what diseases they have. And we want to make sure that better treatments um, become available for these patients that, that are identified and um, approved and tested much more efficiently um, and, and with high quality. We don't want the patients um, to be in diagnostic odyssey because we want them to get their treatments as fast as possible. Um, you can click it again a couple of times. So two strategies that the NIH identified um, to help to achieve a faster diagnosis and better treatments, obviously is what we're talking about these two days is data sharing, and you can click one more time, and clinical trial readiness. So for clinical trial readiness, we mean what are the most sensitive outcomes, um, understanding the natural by understanding the natural history of the disease, we can identify what are the most sensitive outcomes, um, what are the patients that would, will benefit from the various types of treatments, um, how long should you treat these patients, how long should you follow these patients, and a lot of this information we will get from especially our natural history studies, but in addition to the other studies that we're also working. And then, of course, data sharing is we want to share data not only within a consortia because they're going to have multiple um, studies going on. They have multiple researchers. They share the data within the consortia so they can um, answer various research questions, but also share data across consortia. Can looking at data in one of the rare diseases help them to understand the disease progression in um, uh, in, in the specific rare disease that I am studying. So we want to share data across, across the different consortia within the network. And then ultimately, we want to be able to share that data outside of the network. And we've had multiple conversations on different ways to share that data already. But that, all those different data sharing mechanisms are very much top of mind. Next slide. So you saw this slide yesterday, and I just wanted to show it again. Um, we, we do have our 20 consortia. Um, they each are required to have patient advocacy groups, and I've already talked about the value of the patient advocacy groups. And many of these consortia, the patient advocacy groups are extremely active. Um, some of the others, we continue to, to help um, give them guidance and, on how you can even become more involved and more active. And then this also just talks about the things I've already talked about, the data sharing. Um, we're gonna talk about the tools in a little bit and um, et cetera. So next slide. What are the challenges? So we became the DMCC for the RDCRN one year ago. We, um, there was a previous, in, there was a previous um, institution that had the DMCC. Um, we were awarded it this, this latest funding cycle. So we have acquired 15 years of data from the previous cycles. <clears throat> and we will um, need to determine how, what are we gonna do with this and how can we make this data, all this legacy data shareable? So as you heard from Jane, there's a lot of data curation that's gonna be required for this. What are we gonna do with this? Are we gonna try to, to put them into some kind of standard data that'll make data structure that will make them more shareable? We have to determine, we're determining what's the appropriate platform we want to use for, for sharing our data. What's our structure? Um, a data warehouse, a data lake. How to, how, what's going to be the most efficient way to share those data? And we're working actively on that. Then there is the, the, um, the challenge of updating it and or developing our policies and agreements for sharing data, like I said, within, across, and outside. And this was talked yesterday about this is academic research. Researchers don't want to get scooped. They want to be sure that they learn as much from their data as they possibly can before they share it. So working through that as well. 
and then incorporating standards into our new database builds and then also um, maybe um, taking our historical data and um, and transforming that to data standards. Um, CDISC obviously is top of mind, but now we've also hear about the fire standards. And we do know that some of these consortia want to be able to populate their clinical research databases by doing direct, ex direct um, extracts from their EMRs. Next slide. Um, we have a lot of effort going into data standards, and the more I work on data standards, the more I realize that we're not alone in doing this, and we've got to understand what other people are doing as far as uh, data standard efforts, because we, we want them all to, to be in sync. Um, I just saw in the chat about the rare X, so we'll need to check on that. Um, very interested to see that CPATH is, is um, changing or transforming data using CDIS standards. Um, we have a representative from each consortia that is part of this effort. We also have FDA representatives. Uh, thank you to Steve Wilson for being patient and participating in those groups with us and patient advocacy group representatives. We've tried to subdivide this effort. We've got different kinds of data we have to worry about, data standards and metadata. Um, you've got data sets where you have large sets of data that then you somehow um, transfer and summarize into smaller, um, into um, summary measures, for example, imaging data. Um, you, will, you will transform that into, you know, various different summary measures, pharmacokinetic data. We have the typical data like you might see in an ECRF system, demographic, medical history, adverse event data. Um, we have patient reported outcomes data, neurodevelopmental testing data, those kind of data. And then we're also keeping in mind electronic medical records and external data sources and how are they going to inform our data standards. Next slide. It, with, along with data standards and data sharing, we also want to provide tools to our consortia that will help with with this whole process of data sharing, data standards, data analysis. So we kind of lumped our tools into little buckets, um, analytical tools um, that we want to make available across the consortia so that each individual consortia doesn't have to buy these tools themselves, um, that they're more easily accessible, that they can work in the cloud. We're putting our, our data, we're doing our work in the cloud environment. Um, collaboration tools. How can we share documents so that people can learn from each other? How can we collaborate with Zoom and, and uh, regulatory binders? Again, data and documentation storage. We have to be, security is top of mind. We have to be sure that we are, um, we are making sure that, that what we're doing with the data is in a secure environment. Uh, and that's, that's highly um, important, obviously, to us. And then other tools that, that we are developing, like biospecimen tracking systems, um, pedigree generation and visual, visualization tools, et cetera. So we're making these tools available to all of the consortia so, so that we can streamline and uh, make it more efficient to have access to tools. And we will continue to add to these as, as more tools become available. Next slide. So to finish up, and then I'm happy to answer any questions. Again, we want to get new treatments, faster diagnosis, because we want to improve the health and wellness of individuals. What's our road to increasing our knowledge and accelerating discovery? Uh, you can go ahead and click. All the existing consortia and then the new consortia that were just funded this cycle, they've been working in their own little sandbox, in their own little silo. They have a few tools. They have their own data. They have their own sand, and they're, and they're learning and they're building from that. Next click. What we're trying to do is bring them into a more collaborative working relationship so that they can more easily share data across, um, across the different consortia. You can click again. We're pulling together a bunch of tools so that they all have access to more tools than they individually could afford. And you can click again. So that they can each build their own knowledge base, which will be um, very impressive and, and of higher quality than they could do if they don't share data and share tools. And then one more click. 
And maybe, the, maybe together too, they could build this massive knowledge database in the whole rare disease space um, so that they can really do what we're, we're hoping to do is new treatments, faster diagnosis, um, more efficiently. And I think there might be one more click. Our road is not straight. Um, it, we've got some bends and, tur and turns and twists and, and we hope it straightens out um, over time, but it's, it's a massive lift, but we have very dedicated um, researchers working on this and very dedicated people from the NIH, all the program officers, all the project scientists and the DMCC. Thank you. All right, Eileen, thanks very much. I like your uh, very big and, and productive looking sandbox there. It's uh, very impressive. Um, so uh, next I'd like to turn for our first uh, reactant to uh, Klaus Romero. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mark. Uh, Eileen, thank you. That, that, was, uh, that was a great uh, presentation. So a, a few points, and I'm, I'm certainly not gonna take too long uh, that I, that I wanna uh, ensure that, that are, that are uh, captured. I mean, touched on a, on a number of things that are important for us to consider, uh, especially uh, in rare diseases and orphan conditions. Uh, the, the need to avoid having to reinvent the wheel. That, that, is, that is one of the major key principles. Sounds obvious, uh, but it's easier said than done. Um, and she, she touched on a number of things of uh, having to do with with optimizing the the information value of prospective data gathering exercises through the different networks, and this should not just be about uh, the efforts of the of the NIH, but a collective effort uh, across industry, academia, the the patient groups, and of course the nonprofits that that. Uh, that are involved in the in the orchestration of the of the whole uh, ecosystem, because the the more we uh, come together into meetings like this one, and the more we share our collective uh, solutions, and the more we learn from each other, we we avoid reinventing the wheel, and we start generating this uh, virtuous cycle of learn and confirm, which is something that that uh, people like Atul and Jeff uh, know quite well. Uh, where the the learnings from uh, certain gaps that may be present in a very specific data set or collection of data sets can be quantitatively identified and diagnosed, not as a critique, not as a you know as an indictment of the of the particular database or databases, but as a means to uh, again learn and confirm and uh, optimize how uh, future Perspective data collection exercises can address those gaps uh, so that we continuously inform our thinking. The other bit that Eileen touched on, which is really, really important, is the, the um, connectivity across uh, researchers and uh, the, the, the sharing of not just the data to facilitate and accelerate research, but the integration of knowledge coming out of those uh, research questions and research analyses that are done in, in collaborative environments. The, the sharing of those uh, results will again, uh, put the information out there uh, so that we learn what gaps were there, so that we learn what kind of gaps we need to address, whether through future analysis, further analysis, or prospective data collection exercises. That really optimizes the allocation of, of resources uh, for those for those efforts. The the last bit that I would also um, put out there as a as a call to action is the fact that uh, all all these efforts for the advancement of science and for the uh, advancement of of knowledge in general are great, but uh, I would also posit that it is critically important to have all those efforts. Uh, have a level of connectivity with actionable impact for medical product development, and it doesn't it doesn't mean that uh, all of a sudden we're not going to do randomized clinical trials anymore. That's not what I mean. What I mean is that we can leverage the knowledge and the and the information that we can extract from uh, all manner of data sources, from real world data sources to observational studies to patient registries, electronic health records, etc. 
uh, to then help or organize the knowledge as to how we're going to inform the design of future clinical trials, even if it is to understand where the remaining uncertainty lies so that we can address that in, in future uh, data collection studies, but also for the purposes of individual uh, development programs from industry, understand what that uncertainty is and understand quantitatively what the, what the uh, development program is up against. Uh, not, again, not as a critique, not, not as an indictment, but as an opportunity to really inform the thinking and learn from all uh, and every single one of, uh, of the data collection exercises that we're talking about, because with rare diseases, the, the shot cell are, at a goal are not that many, and every single data point is extremely precious. So I'll leave it at that, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Great, uh, uh, Klaus, thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. I'd like to turn next to Nicole Hamlet. Hi, great. Can you hear me? Yes, just fine. Uh, perfect, perfect. Great. Well, I love um, Klaus's comments about turning um, things into actionable uh, outcomes in order to help drug development. So I um, co-direct the CF Therapeutics Development uh, Coordinating Center in Seattle. And just to give you a brief overview of our network, next slide. Um, you can go ahead and flip. I'm sorry, I didn't know that there were builds. I created a little faux pas in terms of, and one more. Great, you can leave there. So we are a clinical trial network of, we've grown from eight centers to 92 centers around the country. And that is because at our peak, um, we have had 100 clinical trials running across 55 different development programs at one time. So we have been um, quite busy as a clinical trial network um, and because of that, our coordinating center actually doesn't run all or execute all of the trials ourselves. Um, we do play a very active role with industry, however, in that our coordinating center uh, serves as a consulting hub for all of these industry trials. And we consult with approximately 40 different um, industry sponsors um, over you know, one year. And that gives us a really good opportunity to utilize our disease-related expertise and to really plan with them on the, the design of their studies and how they fit into the regulatory framework. Um, we also, in order for an industry sponsor to utilize our network, they have to go through a sanctioning process of their protocol. So that gives us some um, you know, scientific rigor and a level of standardization of our protocols um, that is quite unique even though we're not executing all of these ourselves as a coordinating center. That said, um, in terms of our role as a coordinating center, we do uh, execute uh, trials, mostly um, at this point, investigator-initiated studies, and we run about 20, um, 20 studies at a time at our coordinating center. And, um, you know, in terms of full um, study management, and we do maintain a data repository of our uh, trials over the last 20 years since we've existed. So we have a tremendous resource. And that is in addition to our complementary CF patient registry um, that captures about 80 to 90 percent of our population. So those two resources are, are quite complementary. And we've spent an incredible amount of time um, focused on the regulatory issues in order to collect the proper consent um, to make sure that um, we can use the data from our clinical trials for future research and link data together across trials um, and link with our patient registry um, through the use of a unique patient um, registry identifier that then lets us link across studies. And so we've spent a lot of time, um, at least with our investigator initiated studies, making sure that our consent language is in, in place to do that. Um, the trick is moving that into our sponsor uh, studies to enable that as well. Our data repository does include, um, we've been able to get some donations from industry sponsors as well. And we have a tactic in that we, we of course ask for the full study, um, but if not that, then we ask for the placebo data. And if not that, we ask for the baseline data. Um, so we, you know, we um, try to get any data that we can. And um, of course, you know, there are different levels of 
of risk from the company's perspective in terms of the data that they're donating. And there's different points of opportunity to ask for that data as well that we have learned. Uh, next uh, slide. And you can go ahead and flip through this one as well. So I just, there's been a lot of focus on standardization of endpoints, but I want to say that we actually seek beauty in the optimization or seek beauty in the differences um, in terms of how endpoints may be collected differently. And so we actually haven't necessarily pulled all of our data into a standardized database because we pull that data apart and analyze it in order to look at the differences and optimize our endpoints based on how different data was collected differently across studies and that has helped us tremendously to look at how our data um, uh, can be both uh, statistically and clinically optimized and then i'll just end by saying um, on the next slide um, sorry i don't know what happened to the um yeah that our um our trial design and our landscapes are changing immensely and in terms of actionable items. One unique thing that we do as a network is not just study design planning, but drug development planning. And we work on sponsored agnostic um, drug development plans um, that pull in data from our registry to look at feasibility, our clinical trial database to look at, um, you know, what is going to be the optimal design, and then patient data in terms of their perspective on feasibility. And we pull that into design um, planning uh, and scenarios, but then we have had very successful collaborations with the FDA um, in a sponsor agnostic fashion to really look at these new roadmaps that we are proposing. And this is something that I think um, is unique and been a great um, advancement for our network to propose novel um, approaches for drug development in the future. So I'll just end there. Thank you. Great. Uh, uh... Thanks very much, uh, Nicole. Very comprehensive uh, overview of what you're doing. Appreciate it. Uh, so next is uh, Ian Winburn. Hi. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, it's it is absolutely wonderful to be able to join this uh, this panel. And you know, thank you, Eileen and Klaus and Nicole, for really, you know, hitting every nail squarely on the head in terms of what is important here. You know, I think. What I find the most refreshing is, of course, you know, on this panel, we have different perspectives um, and coming from different parts of the clinical trial and clinical care and clinical de development uh, continuum. But what I think unites us here is the uh, reality that this in rare diseases is all actually about faster diagnosis and better treatments. And Eileen, to hear you articulate that so clearly you know, fully resonates certainly for us as a, as a, a, a manufacturer and uh, as an industry member, it, it, it completely resonates. I think I, I, there's a few key points I want to pick up that, that others have already made and just really to add some slight nuances onto them. You know, Eileen, right at the start, you, you, you talked about the importance of natural history and, and I'd go a step further and talk about natural history and epidemiology because what we clearly see within the rare disease space is, by by definition, the 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 diseases that we're we're interested in, we're involved in. By definition, they are rare, and we find that whilst um, clearly there are are, are are data gaps and and gaps in knowledge around um, the natural history of disease, even some of the basic epidemiology and some of the even the larger rare diseases, there are huge gaps there. And I find that working collaboratively through uh, partnerships with real world evidence, real world data registries, uh, th those organizations that can come together and collectively make epidemiological assessments, are, 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 it's so critical and vital to our work uh, that, that you know, we, we hold those very, very close and very dear. I know later on we're gonna talk about um, standardization and some of the challenges that we face sort of with um, sort of data sharing particularly and in, in, in clinical research networks and and I think some of the uh, efforts Nicole that you highlighted through the coordination center in an effort to build uh, standardization by having overview of multiple 
um, protocols and, and, and being able to build in some standardization, I think is really a learning I take away from, from, from already from this panel discussion. And I think we will, we'll discuss it more, but standardization, not just of, of how data is acquired and defined, but also uh, some of the assays that, that may be utilized to capture data again in the rare disease space you would you would hope you would dream that we'd have some standardization in this it, it, with some of these uh, key assays and endpoints that we're looking to to monitor and and it's challenging and i think when again when you're bringing in the complexity of collaboration and the the beauty of collaboration one of the challenges we clearly need to overcome is is, is questions around standardization and how best to define it my my, my final point um that has resonated massively for me was around sharing cross rare diseases. And this is something that we are, are, are constantly challenging ourselves at Pfizer to do. Uh, particularly, you know, we, we are moving very much in the gene therapy space. And gene therapy, as we know, is an evolving technology and an evolving therapeutic across multiple rare diseases but there are some common platform components depending obviously on the modality in vivo ex vivo etc where it's going to be absolutely vital that learnings are shared across these different therapeutic areas where gene therapies are ultimately going to be trialed you know again i come back to epidemiology seroprevalence data um, and the variance of it from country to country, from uh, age group. And there are so many variables in this, but at the same time, collecting that data, sharing it across the gene therapy community so that the right trials are designed so that the right uh, uh, potential therapeutics are, are also designed, you know, can only do the best for benefit of, of patients. And that brings me right to the final final bit and that is throughout this whole uh you know two days and particularly that this panel discussion you've heard how central the patients patient advocacy groups are into these discussions and a lot of our collaborative work we do in the rare disease space particularly around real world data development and registry development is done in partnership with patient advocacy and we couldn't do it without the insights that come from patients who know their, uh, the, the rare disease infinitely better than, 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 than many of us researchers who are involved in it. Um, we're very you know, grateful for the insights and also the partnerships and, and the openness um, to really come together to achieve those original goals as we started out, which is faster diagnosis and better treatments. So thank you. I will stop there and, and, and hand back to yourself, Mark. Great. Uh, thank, thanks very much, Ian. And I'd like to turn now to Dina Zahn from FDA. Hi. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this uh, panel. I feel um, my role as being the last member of this panel is going to be a little redundant. Um, I am, um, I'm here because I'm a medical officer at the FDA um, in the Division of Rare Diseases and Medical Genetics, and I have a clinical background of being a pediatric geneticist for a fair number of years. Um, and as we, you've already heard, there's been a, a robust discussion about the challenges of collaborative data um, management and data coordination in rare disease. Um, and as we talk about these challenges, it really helps me to focus on three core questions. Um, and many of, and these questions have been discussed um, throughout the last two days. And aspects of these questions were really um, already mentioned by Eileen and Nicole in their respective programs for the uh, clinical research core and coordinating center in their programs. But I think if we take this full circle, these questions really go back to basics. The first question is, is the right information being collected? And it appears as a self-evident question, but regulators, clinicians, and patients approach this question differently um, and can uh, throughout a long time. So we, we really need um, communication early amongst all the stakeholders, um, not just about study data, 
but also how to come to consensus about data to document in routine clinical care that might be utilized in an electronic uh, record. Um, and that type of conversation can be really fruitful short-term and mostly long-term. Um, the next question, is this data collected appropriately? Um, for example, do the laboratory-based data reflect samples that were not degraded prior to analysis? So this, again, goes back at a very early step in the data that you're looking at. Um, as was mentioned yesterday, our colleagues in pediatric oncology really systematize standardization for routine patient care in a, the pediatric oncology clinic, and that has really served um, to be successful to understand not just the natural history of the groups of diseases and even the more rare diseases that they treat, but also analysis of treatment options and facilitation of communication amongst medical caregivers. It's, this paradigm has really uh, worked well, and the rare disease communities um, are, would be best served to really think about this paradigm because for on a patient-to-patient -patient level, every piece of data for a child in the pediatric oncology um, system it can be utilized. Um, so the last question that I'd like us to think about is, are we describing the data in the same way across studies? Um, clinical investigators in different institutions in different countries can administer the same pediatric developmental evaluation with minor variations, but those variations can impact outcomes. Um, so we need to systematize that and talk about how we address that, again, for the clinical record, but also in studies. And we need to account how improvement in technology impacts the data already collected. Are there new biomarkers for a particular disease? Has the laboratory analysis quality been improved? Rare disease patients often have unique testing that initiates as research and in the best of all possible circumstances um, becomes CLIA approved. But that can be a long road. And you know, the, one of the questions that's important to look at as uh, people are looking at this data is how does this evolution of testing and what you're testing for and the quality of testing and the different ways to, to uh, evaluate the same biomarker, how does that impact data interpretation over time? So collecting the right information in the appropriate manner and description become all the more important when used in collaboration both for natural history and any given drug development program. And in the best situation, most, most of the information collected in a database is useful and hopefully informative to at least describe disease presentation at different points of progression or even to help describe heterogeneity of response for a specific product. From the perspective, from my own perspective of both a regulator and a clinician, if multiple stakeholders can establish an ease of communication with these questions in mind, data collection from a single disease or across a group of similar diseases could be interpretable across both clinical and regulatory standards and ultimately be um, impactful for patients. Thank you. Great. Uh, um, thanks very much for, for, for those comments, Dina. Really, really appreciate it. So I've um, had some great discussion already, and I now want to open it up more to our, our panelists uh, um, more collectively, as well as all of you who are, uh, who are with us. And, and just a reminder, if you do have a, a comment or question, uh, please send it. Uh, you can send it to all panelists and attendees, all panelists and attendees. If it's like, if it's something you'd like to, to share with everyone, if uh, uh, you wanted to go more narrowly to us to, to work into the discussion, you can also send to uh, any of our, send a, a chat a comment to any of our co-hosts. Uh, but we uh, uh, definitely want to hear from you. You can also send to rd.data at Duke. Dot edu. And I want to maybe start this off. Uh, you all provided a, a great overview um, of um, uh, the role of collaborative research networks and accelerating progress and some of the key, many of the key components uh, that we uh, were seeing ad adopted and, and that can be helpful for uh, expanding uh, these kinds of efforts. Um, one of the questions that already came up was 
to what extent is this work uh, really global versus uh, US focused? Uh, so obviously there are not that many rare disease patients. The more that we can, can bring in a, uh, a larger international base, uh, it would seem the better. Uh, on the other hand, um, we, we talked about um, uh, differences in, in perhaps uh, patient uh, characteristics or at least uh, features of disease or prevalence of disease that may vary across countries and there certainly are regulatory um, differences, data, um, institutional differences that matter too. And so I'm not sure who wants to start on this one, but um, how global are we and, and what are the opportunities for becoming more global in these efforts? Um, I'll talk and if you have trouble hearing me with my uh, speaker, let me know. No, just it's it's actually it's gotten better, Eileen. I don't know what you did, but uh, thank you. <laughs> um, so, as far as the rare disease, the RDCRN, um, we do have multiple um, foreign sites in the RDCRN, and depending upon the particular rare disease, um, we we do have a databases set up. So, as far as as collecting the data they are collected into our electronic data collection system. So they're collected in a standardized manner within a particular protocol. And they, under this, the IRB process, of course, they're all collecting data under a standard protocol for a particular study. Um, we obviously have to make sure that we have all the regulatory requirements in place um, with regards to being able to collect and house those data. But we do we do have representation from foreign sites in in RDC here and in some of the rare diseases. Other comments on this? Yeah, it's uh, it's in here. I, in answer to the question of how global are we, um, I think we are we could be more global. I think there are a lot of challenges that that stand in the way of taking a truly global approach, and 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 many of them have been discussed. Um, with different approaches, different natural history of diseases, the way that diseases manage differing from country to country. However, the, the central point is, for me anyway, is that, and I, and, I, and I think it was really beautifully highlighted sort of in the last um, uh, sort of reflection was every single data point matters. And particularly when you're talking about low frequency events, low frequency observations in a small population, the need to bring data together globally, for me, is paramount. And we have to really rise to the challenges. And I particularly look you know, globally in, in many rare diseases, there will be multiple disease registries. And, you know, philosophically, you could argue, well, even if we could bring all this data together and, and, and come past, you know, the, the data privacy regulations and, and everything else that comes with it and consent and all the challenges, philosophically, methodologically, is it right to pull all this data given all the challenges and all the differences we've talked about with the disease? However, I think what we need to be able to do is have that data set together and then to ask the right questions of it to, with all the caveats that we know exist. But having disparate data sets in rare disease for me it, it, it is counterintuitive given the nature of rare diseases. So I, I don't think we're there. I think there are a lot of challenges, but but I think it's something that we should be striving to as much as possible. Yeah. I, I think um, uh, just from, from going back to my time as a clinician, I think empowerment of clinicians in who are who may not have research grants, but are with the patients um, and having some ability to, to include them because they know what is, is um, easy or reasonable to be able to get um, in the clinic. They also have a phenomenal insight. Um, and if you look at some of rare diseases where paradigms have been created, such as Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, it's a very rare disease, but it would, it's a, a group of, hematolo of hematology oncologists who came together with clinical geneticists to monitor patients over time in their own clinics 
and come up with a paradigm for how to monitor them for cancer risk. It was clinician-based. It was not, um, not anything of a higher level, but if we empower more clinicians in the clinic, I think um, there will be a lot of networking and a lot of communication that people can benefit from to help do this. Thanks. Uh, Nicole, did you have a comment? Uh, yeah, no, I was just going to say at the 20,000 foot level, I'm, you know, trying to find more, um, you know, where can we find more motivation or incentives for global partnerships to, to, to donate data, whether that be academic investigators or, you know, I'm thinking industry um, sponsors as well. And I, I think that, uh, you know, one of our challenges still is at the very, very high level is knowing that there is a shared um, regulatory path, um, for instance, you know, globally, such that, um, you know, the same studies that we design in a rare disease setting will be applicable both in Europe and the U.S. Um, because that creates sort of a framework that everybody is working towards the same momentum. For instance, if we need a historical controlled or externally controlled study, um, that that will be accepted both by the FDA and the EMA, for instance. Um, that's very powerful, and that may encourage more sponsors to donate to that resource um, in order to access that, knowing, you know, the methodology, I agree with Ian, that needs to be figured out, whether, you know, how to do that and how that's appropriate. Mm -hmm. But I think that at a very high level um, also is some of the work um, I know that some of the work that we try to do as a, as a disease network is how do we engage with our global partners overseas um, and work with regulators to kind of seek that harmonization because we cannot afford to have different regulatory pathways in the rare disease setting and do multiple phase twos and uh, or phase threes. Um, but so I think creating more incentives and um, you know, a framework towards where we're ultimately trying to get to is, is one way towards that path. Thank you. I think Nicole really uh, brought up a, a really good point about uh, the, the whole concept of incentives. And so it, it takes, it, that, that question takes different perspectives to answer. So uh, let, me, let me just get back to the point you raised about uh, what called harmonization of the, of the regulatory pathways. One, one it, trying to just say, oh, you guys get your act together between FDA and EMA, and you, you have to figure that out, it's easier said than done. Because if you put yourself, and I'm not speaking for the agency, uh, but if you put yourself in their shoes, uh, what, what are they also lacking that the community as a whole has not provided? a ton of quantitative understandings of the sources of variability, the heterogeneity in response, the natural history and how to tell some populations apart that can help sponsors inform how to select patients and how to design studies. The, so one way to make sure that instead of just saying, oh, you guys need to get your act together and, and, and figure this out, we can actually become a, a change agent in a helpful way by being able to integrate the data and provide those solutions that will help regulators and industry uh, understand exactly, have a, have a common background quantitative language that they all speak. That is a component of the solution, component of the, of the incentives for, for uh, the, the patient groups. Well, at the end of the day, data are precious, and, and the patient groups need to uh, are always striving to ensure that the information value of every single data point gets maximized to its absolute limit. One of the things that that uh, that they because resources are limited, what's in it for me? It's ensuring that the contributions of the of the patient community by participating in research doesn't die with the primary analysis of a single study, be it observational or be it uh, a randomized clinical trial. That's another component of the, of the, of the social incentives from, mm -hmm. from that angle of the equation. Great, uh, thanks. Uh, there's a great discussion of incentives, which I wanna come back to and, and, and reasons that people should come together, both 
in the U.S. and globally uh, around these uh, networks. But uh, let me go to, we have a couple of hands raised. Let me first go to uh, Jeff Barrett. Jeff, I don't know if you had a comment on this uh, topic or, or something else. <laughs> I, I just wanted to add to the point that Klaus was making around the information value because when we talk about the need to be global in terms of our request to populate the rare disease data, I can recognize that we really should keep in mind a fit for purpose approach and do this in a targeted way because you know, having more of the same type of data isn't necessarily uh, valuable as it is to fill gaps in certain areas where we are more deficient. So, and I, again, having done work in the global health setting before, it's important that we educate along the way because there are barriers to getting this kind of data. So those are the two points I wanted to make. Great. Uh, uh, thanks very much, Jeff. And uh, continuing with this theme around reasons to participate, I'd um, like to go to Tina uh, Irv. Um, I think you had a, a, a comment or, or challenge for the, uh, for the group. Sorry. Tina, Hi. Uh, can, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, so, um, so one of the biggest challenges we have in the RDCRN is, A, we have people who are established, you know, who've been doing it for 15 years. That will be very hard to change. But we even have new groups that say, well, we already have these forms. This is how we collect data. Why should we standardize? It's, you know, it's just making more work for us. What, what is the point? And I'm wondering if you all had thought of any, I've just had this discussion twice today, actually. <laughs> you know, do you have any ideas of incentives? Um, you know, we can tell them that you know, it'll be faster, it'll be cheaper if you do it this way. But you know, getting them to, to get over the hump or crossing the line into to buying into, yes, this is the direction science is going and, and we need to all work together. Yeah, yeah, faster or cheaper may not be uh, concrete enough. I think uh, Laura uh, Johnson, I think you may have some comments on this and I wanna turn this back to the panel. So if you all could be thinking about your response too. Uh, but Laura, um, could you unmute and? Sure. So I think it's really important, and to Tina's point, you know, people, and this includes the researchers, the sponsors, patients, caregivers, clinicians, everyone in the rare disease area. I, I want y'all to understand that in my work in the last five years of FDA, I've seen far more trials and studies that have come and planned without regulatory intent than I have seen planned with regulatory intent. And, and what, you know, something exciting happens and there's a marketing interest now. And I see Nicole nodding her head, yeah. And so I think a really key part for our natural history and registry data is that, you know, this is regularly used to make regulatory decisions in rare disease spaces. And the faster we can use that data, the better. Because when you're trying to back in to see the standards, things like that, you're wasting time. And so that means everything from the beginning to end, as Anne and many others have said, you know, everything having data that's sufficient for regulatory use. And that goes from your consent to data standards, et cetera, is really important. And also, understanding of a person's data is coming in from multiple data sources. As a statistician, I've sometimes found like, oh, some of my control people are also now in this intervention arm and I've got to magically match it up. And how did I find it? By accident, an inspector found it, completely had to revise what we're doing. So I think it's really important, like we all talk about scientific ethics and standards, et cetera, but poor science, it really is just flat out poor science, I think, personally, yeah. to assume your study data is not going to be used by a regulator, especially in the rare disease space. Yeah, so Laura, thanks. And uh, this does get us to uh, some of the other questions that are on the discussion question um, page, that the slide that, that's up. And I, I do want to hear from the, the panelists on this. And this seems like it gets to the heart of why uh, should people participate? Well, presumably it's because they want to do the meaningful clinical trials more effectively and, and, and less expensively. But would like you all to expand on, we've had lots of discussion about why, but maybe expand on some of the specific reasons uh, that you can think think of to help uh, address uh, uh, the comments that we've just heard from Laura and others. Nicole, do you want to start? 
I, I, I do, I, to echo Laura's comment, I mean, yeah, we treat all of our investigator initiated studies, we treat as if they're an industry sponsored study as well for that very exact reason is that they, that data could very well be used to support um, a rare disease application in the future. Um, but I, you know, I still go, think it goes back to, I think, um, you know, the, the incentives or, you know, trying to encourage industry sponsors to um, contribute is our, I think, biggest challenge. And, you know, the, the biggest way that we can get over that is, um, is uh, through them seeing the value of how our current data has benefited them. And I will say, I think that you know, we actually achieve success in getting donations and it's sometimes slightly different. There's slightly different arms that we work with. You know, the um, it's the data sharing agreement sometimes where things get held up, the actual legal portion of it than necessarily the buy off. So I want to differentiate between that as well, because I think I, I want to um, I want to give a lot of credit to our industry sponsors because I feel like they buy into this. I think it gets caught up because there are a lot of legal things that um, that may prohibit this. And this is where we try to be a little bit flexible too in terms of what we ask for. Um, we may not ask for the full you know, intervention arm as long with if they have a placebo group. Um, we may ask for their contribution of their placebo group or just their baseline data. Um, we have done, you know, having access to their baseline data has given us some very rich natural history data on lab abnormalities that we wouldn't normally have um, to better characterize um, whether or not we have a safety signal in a different study. So um, we've tried to be flexible to really optimize the contribution to our own data repository. Uh, th thanks for those comments, and I appreciate your point about um, sponsor participation. And uh, it would seem like sponsors would want uh, less expensive, uh, uh, more productive trials. So, uh, Ian, um, maybe we could go to you for uh, for your thoughts about this. <laughs> yeah. So, <clears throat> I think you know clearly working on the the, the assumption and the start. Well, not the assumption. Working on the starting point of of regulatory grade data and data generation, then I think if we were in a situation where we had the opportunity to uh, collaborate externally around data generation, data sharing, that was going to expedite uh, any clinical development program, you know, we would, we would jump at it. And, and I think we have actually, you know, some examples in rare disease where, where that has been the case. I think also particularly in post-marketing surveillance and I think the the partnerships that you know industry certainly uh, enter into um, around real-world data uh, collection uh, in that post-marketing space and how that data is used to support uh, regulatory commitments around the understanding of medicines um, again, I think it, it, it is pretty common practice and particularly in the rare disease space uh, now. Um, but, but it, yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm in, in verbal agreement here, you know, coming from our perspective that, that, that you know, given the opportunities, we, we, we would always look to embrace it. And I think just coming on to data sharing, you know, and, and Nicole, you know, you mentioned a question about, you know, approaching uh, sponsors and, 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 and industry for data sets. Again, from a policy perspective, you know, we, we, we again support that data sharing with researchers. You know, we, we, we provide de-identified de patient level data upon request, you know, to qualified scientific and medical researchers, you know, who submit, you know, a scientifically valid research proposal through our portals. That's something that we go out and do. Similarly, we share data with clinical trial participants. Again, if they believe uh, that anyone, you know, we, we, we massively value the commitment it is to be involved in a clinical trial and, and for patients, if, if they wish and where it's permitted, you know, we will provide their data back to them. So I think there are the, I can't speak obviously for all industry partners, but I can certainly speak for, for, for Pfizer here that I think we have in place the will the desire, but also some of the 
processes and policy really to support this. And um, Klaus, if I could go to you next, um, I have some thoughts on ways of um, making clear what the benefits are to participation along the lines of, um, again, helping to get to regulatory grade uh, uh, um, data and trial conduct. Right, and and so the 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 point about the the you know the the people with established careers and and saying what's the point? Uh, one 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 of the things that we've observed, granted in a couple of non-rare diseases where we've done these kinds of, of uh, data integration and interoperability exercises has been the following. The, what resonates with those types of individuals is the following message. Do you wanna become attractive for industry to look at your data and fund you to continue to generate the data that you generate? One way to remain competitive is not just the fact that you're an outstanding scientist and an amazing scholar with a ton of publications, but the fact that uh, your data is not going to be a quote unquote a headache for industry to handle uh, because industry recognizes that yes, academics are really, really smart, but sometimes their data are a little bit of a mess. So the, the fact that uh, that uh, that added value that you can offer to them to be, increase their, their competitiveness or attractiveness to industry is one that we have heard uh, resonate quite well uh, with those academics. Something to consider for, for these kinds of conversations in, in rare diseases. Yeah, I think that kind of gets back to, we had this discussion about pre-competitive space for kind of more efficient um, uh, um, industry participation studies. Uh, it seems like a pre-competitive space for, for academics as well is a, a good theme to, uh, to build on. And you all have laid out a lot of the, the features that, that um, these networks can provide to help with that. Um, I would like to go now to, to a perspective from an, another uh, important source of, of data and momentum, as, uh, as Nicole emphasized, which is uh, patient advocacy organizations organizations uh, getting to uh, regulatory level um, quality of, uh, of data collection. And uh, Terry, Joe, uh, Bichelle had a, a question along those lines. Uh, what is the best way for a patient advocacy organization to get regulatory input into natural history data collection prior to uh, any clinical, tri uh, clinical trial planning? Uh, any of you want to provide some, uh, uh, some suggestions on that? So, Mark, this is Michelle Campbell from FDA, and I'll just chime in on that question. We, we have seen that, <laughs> um, and some of us are trying to chat. Um, there are multiple options to engage the agency. The first is a Critical Path Innovation Meeting, or CPIM, um, which you can find um, on our website um, that will uh, allow to get early uh, non-binding advice and current thinking of the agency um, and can really help and so a group would submit questions early on. Um, there's also um, could be a potential to contact a review division depending on disease and progression through that, that pathway um, through more of the IND pathway um, and of course um, you know there's also the uh, the patient affairs staff that does patient listening sessions to learn more. So there is opportunity for early engagement with the agency. Um, and I think those are probably the three, three ways or pathways that uh, we would suggest. Great. Uh, uh, thanks very much. Um, looks like uh, Ian, did you have a comment? Yeah, it, it was just to, to add to that, you know, from, from EMA perspective, again, you know, I appreciate it. And it's fantastic. We have FDA, you know, so engaged in, in, in in these two days, but but it's similar with EMA. Um, I can't speak obviously for them, but I know that we work, for example, with a patient advocacy organization in the haemophilia space who are looking to pull together a global registry uh, within haemophilia and, and they sought scientific advice from EMA on this protocol that has been built in collaboration with members of the clinical community, the patient community, and also industry sponsors. And there were mechanisms by which they could seek that early advice to, to move that project forward. So it was just also to add an, an, another perspective from, uh, from Europe. Great. Uh, th thanks, Ian. And uh, for those of you who are on uh, chat, uh, Dina just uh, posted a, a nice uh, web link to some of the FDA resources on, on this topic. 
Um, hard to believe that we're already at, uh, close to the end of this session. I um, would like to maybe give our panelists um, uh, just a, a minute uh, or so each for any final comments that they'd like to add, you know, looking at these discussion questions. Um, we, we've really tried to get beyond um, the, the general goal of uh, faster, better clinical trials and, and, and regulatory submissions to how exactly the clinical networks are, or how exactly these collaborative research networks are supporting those efforts. And I'd like you all to maybe end on um, a final thought that we haven't perhaps touched on as much as we should about specific approaches to doing that. So data uh, standardization has come up, uh, other tools and analytic supports that the, the networks can provide, um, ways of engaging a, a broader set of uh, uh, these, uh, these small populations, um, but would appreciate any final thoughts that you all have on advancing these efforts. And, uh, and maybe I could start with uh, Eileen. Sure. So lots of things come to mind, but um, when you're talking about the academic researchers like we have in the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network, their number one priority are their patients, caring for their patients and, and improving the lives and health of their patients. I think the collaborative research network, the thing that we have to, to think about with them is number one, how can we make their life easier um, as far as if, if we implement data standards and we implement data, data sharing, how can we make that such that we're not complicating their life even, even further? And this gets back to, to my comment again about how can we deal with, with getting data out of the MR and into the clinical research network. The other thing about these researchers is a lot of them, especially in the RD Syrian, do not have experience working in, regulate, in the regulated industry. So, the, D the DMCC that we have have a lot of um, individuals who came from the pharmaceutical or CRO industry. So from regulatory to data management to statistics, training them on what is, training and advising them on what is required to get a drug to market has been really important and helping them to navigate that process. And having a resource center available to these networks that have that expertise, and, and I'm realizing there's unique expertise about the regulatory process that's needed to get rare and ultra-rare uh, drugs for rare and ultra-rare diseases approved. And it may not be exactly the same process you might use for a more common disease, um, because you just don't have enough patients. Um, thank you. Uh, Klaus, any final thought? Uh, yeah, I mean, at the, at the risk of sounding redundant, I mean, the, the, the name of the game really is being able to uh, properly handle uh, uncertainty and source of variability in rare diseases where the challenges are bigger because of the, of the patient pool. And the fact that even in this uh, specific area of, of rare and open conditions, the, the, the value of every single data point needs to be maximized to its absolute ceiling. And uh, if we understand, if we all understand that and have, keep that as a compass, uh, we, can, we can work through a lot of the solutions that we need to uh, build to get to that point. Great, uh, thanks very much. And uh, Nicole? Great, um, building off a com you know, um, the comments that Dina had, um, as we think about data sharing, I just think the how is just as important as the what. Um, in terms of what, you know, how we're collecting things is just as important as what we're collecting and we cannot lose that information because that is so critical to defining our endpoints and optimizing them in the future. And in particular, given the current landscape, I think clinical research is going to start changing over time with the influx, influx of telemedicine. We're all going to be pushed a little bit, perhaps a little bit out of our comfort zone. Um, you know, just speaking from my own um, network, the creativity that's going into create, you know, collecting data during this time on the same endpoints, but in a different manner. You know, we're going to need to sort that out um, eventually into the future to see, you know, how we can, uh, you know, make trials more efficient to, efficient for our patients, but on the same time, what 
um, impact that has on our endpoints. And so as we think about combining all this data, um, we've really got to make sure we capture that and don't lose that um, moving forward. Uh, thanks very much. And, and Ian? Uh, I I, I think the only point I, I would add here, and I think it talks a little bit to the incentives that were touched on earlier on, you know, how can we incentivize some of the collaboration and sharing um, and standardization and everything else. I think it really comes down to a very clear communication that to be able to achieve the lofty goals that we are all trying to do, we have to ultimately unite we have to at times uh, um, concede on things that maybe we've held dearly in the spirit of moving things forward and i think being able to have a very clear articulation that we are not going to achieve our goals and our ambitions in rare diseases in silos acting alone wanting to further our own individual institution or organization rather than the collective and it is that collective rare disease community then you know i i, I don't think we're going to be successful and i think it is going to come down to ultimately a very clear and consistent communication from all stakeholders that that is the way forward and all being well you know that we get that buy-in to that concept and that's the incentive that people need to ultimately know that we are going to make a difference for those patients, those people who really need our help. Okay, great, uh, uh, thanks very much. And uh, Dina, um, this is maybe not the final comment, but if you want, it could be the final question. I really appreciate the, uh, your efforts with this panel and, and our other colleagues at, at FDA who have been uh, so helpfully contributing. Um, any other topics, questions, specific issues uh, that, that you'd like to make sure the, the panel addresses before we, before we wrap up and, and move on to the, the last session, which I encourage everybody to stay for, it can be a discussion of uh, next steps from here but uh, uh, Dean any final uh, question or, or thoughts you know I think um, with the idea that everybody has has really so eloquently stated before me that I'll get a chance to reiterate with all data points being important the natural history um, data points are the ones that I think we miss because we may not know we have a diagnosis until later and so finding a way for the clinicians who are who are trying to help and come up with a reason and a rationale for these patients, finding a way for them to be able to collect quality information that can be utilized from the beginning and resources for them to ask for help often. I think that is something to keep in mind in the back of our minds because that will help to um, help to provide greater natural history than we have right now. Um, which will be ultimately more important and more helpful to any study um, that we try and do. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's nice to hear how all this fits together. And I should just say in the chat, there have been a few more uh, posts about the resources that FDA has available um, for uh, engaging uh, patient advocates and, and patient groups, uh, particularly around issues of um, collecting useful data on natural history. Um, Eileen, you started off this final round of comments by noting that we need to make this as easy and straightforward as possible on clinicians who are, who are busy to, to provide this information. Um, any um, uh, final comment based on what you just heard from, from Dina about um, how we can make it as, uh, what tools are available to make this as easy as possible for um, clinician participation? Um, I don't know that I have anything additional to, to what I've been saying so far. Yeah. Great. Well, I think that's a, a great place to end this session on and move on into, into the, the final session on, on next steps. But uh, before I do that, I, I would like to thank all of our uh, uh, panelists, all of you who uh, pre presented and, and commented uh, on this session. Uh, really good 
uh, discussion about some of the uh, very important opportunities for collaborative research networks to support rare disease drug development and ways for uh, patient advocate groups and, and clinicians uh, as well to get better supported in that, uh, in that process. So, so thank you all very much. And I'd now like to move on to session six, which is our final session on synthesis and, and next steps. Uh, here we want to uh, think about some of the key takeaways from the last two days and potential next steps from uh, all of our panels. Uh, as well as a, an opportunity for a couple of uh, final uh, comments, questions, uh, input from uh, all of you who are participating with us uh, today. Um, we've got, um, uh, we, we've talked a lot about uh, uh, themes and, and I'm not going to try to uh, to recap what uh, all of them are here, um, but um, would like to, to uh, start off this session with comments from uh, many of our, from a, uh, another set of uh, discussants uh, in this session, and that includes uh, Anne Pariser, who's director of the uh, Office of Rare Diseases Research at the National Center for Translational Science uh, at NIH. Uh, Vanessa Boulanger, who's Director of Research at the National Organization of Rare Disorders. Uh, Klaus uh, Romero, again, Chief Science Officer at the Critical Path Institute. And Billy Dunn, Acting Director of the Office of Neuroscience at FDA. And again, these are to kick off our uh, discussion and our remaining time together. So uh, Anne, let me turn to you first. Thank you very much, and, and thank you uh, very much to the organizers uh, for inviting me. This has really been a great two days and uh, some really interesting discussion. So this uh, session is called Synthesis and Next Steps. So I started with the synthesis and tried to boil down some of what I've heard um, these past two days and into really um, three key thoughts. So next, please. So. Um, you know, we, we always try to learn from what's going on in other areas, um, and um, that, um, that made me think back to something that Katie Donahue started in the very first session, actually, is she was talking about um, cancer, and cancer in the 1950s with Sidney Farber, and um, how it was an example of very early collaboration that changed everything. So um, this is actually chronicled very well in this book by Siddhartha Mukherjee um, that ended up winning a Pulitzer Prize called The Emperor of All Maladies um, with cancer being the emperor. But if you've never read this book, I would really, um, really urge you to do so because it was just a, a phenomenal example of how they moved the cancer research agenda forward, which I think really resonates with, with rare diseases. But um, not only did Sidney Farber pull the, the, the um, research community together to work on these diseases, but he did something very groundbreaking is he went out to the patient community and he actually um, initially started uh, um, working with um, uh, one of the prominent socialites at the time, and this is back in the 1950s when working with the patient community and patients involved in their own health and um, certainly leadership in any kind of research agenda was extremely unusual. And uh, they teamed up and what they, they did was um, they really uh, put the cause of the patients out front, but they also turned cancer into a public health issue, which up until then, as far as I know, it really been only infectious diseases that have fallen under this. And they managed over the, uh, the years uh, working uh, behind the scenes and raising awareness um, to get a, a report on cancer that culminated into uh, this uh, Richard Nixon signing the National Cancer Act of 1971, which later was referred to as the war on cancer. So next. So what that led to, and I think this is very, very relevant to us, is um, a large scale and sustained funding for cancer research that um, in addition to what the more traditional research, research grants and um, investigators working individually on their own, what that led to was the building of infrastructure, which I'll come back to in a minute. And then more recently, next please is um, the, so the latest addition to this is the uh, cancer moonshot. So next slide. 
And so that led to uh, thought number two on infrastructure. And just to name a few things, next please. Uh, again, looking at our friends in cancer world, what they built were things like NCI designated cancer centers and this uh, cancer university research and as well as treatment network. Um, they were early adopters of registries, a SEER database uh, being the cancer statistics and epidemiology database that um, uh, has now very long standing, has a lot of information there. More recently, looking into the bioinformatics and big data. Um, and then also things like the children's oncology group that um, at least 90% of children with cancer in this country are, are treated in, in these centers. So it's this infrastructure and this backbone that has contributed to a great deal of, of what we see now. Um, in more recent years, uh, next please. This is now moving into um, these more platform approaches. I put two of them up here, lung map and iSpy, which is the breast cancer. Um, where uh, trying to pull in basically anybody with a lung cancer um, which or, or breast cancer, which are really not one disease, but collections of diseases. And so that any patient can have an opportunity to participate in a trial no matter what. But this also um, gives us an opportunity uh, for collecting um, organized data uh, only in a different way. And then next, please, um, the most recent addition would be uh, my part, which um, came out of the uh, Cancer Moonshot, which is now focusing on rare cancers where they're trying to adopt some of these very same things. So it's build the infrastructure, they will come um, and we can support multiple cancers, multiple diverse cancers and multiple um, diverse patients under these more collective approaches. So next please. So what, is, what does that mean for rare diseases? Well, um, we've adopted some of these approaches. Um, Eileen has talked a lot and Tina as well talked about our rare disease clinical research network, um, which is you know another uh, collective approach as well as uh, the radar registry program which came up yesterday and I put the links here. But uh, we're also now moving into platform approaches where we've recently started so something called PAVGT or Platform Vector Gene Therapy Programs. Um, so in, in PAVGT, which is experiment in its early days, we're trying to develop uh, four gene therapies for four different diseases uh, collectively under one platform, but also under master protocols, which you know, is a different way of thinking about data collections. Um, and also what I, I should have pointed out on, on the um, prior slide is um, Lung Map, iSpy, and uh, the Children's Oncology uh, Network, they all have .org on the back of their, their websites. So these were intended right out of the gate really to be these um, not just government um, platform building, but to collect multiple stakeholders in a collaborative way um, right from the start. So next, and um, so then thought number three, um, which is always uh, the question of scalability for us. Um, we have 7,000 diseases and uh, data operability in that kind of a situation is, is always a little tricky. So we've heard of a number of different approaches to this, you know, put everybody in a network and try to develop collective standards, process data after the fact, or set it up as a platform um, to begin with. Um, and um, uh, they all work. They all work, and they're all they're all feasible. We just need need more of them. And uh, just in addition to some of the you know the things we've heard about these last two days, and some of these really uh, wonderful um, uh, approaches that are that are going on, I just wanted to mention that NCATS also is um, stepping into this with um, with the Center for for Data to, to Health or CD2H, which is a very large initiative that started through the the CTSA program. Um, and uh, the the mission um, within the mission statement, they, they took a quote. It says, "What happens when data sets become too large to share? When the data from various sources are so dissimilar, they cannot be combined easily with another related but different data set?" Which I think has been a lot of what we've been talking about these days. So they've been fo focusing on developing um, a translational science informatics ecosystem. It includes resource 
cores, tools, cloud computing, architecture, uh, fair data principles, of course, but then the HL7 fire interoperability roadmap where there's a lot of explorations there. Um, and this too has on its website a dot org, uh, meaning that it's, you know, it's a, a multi-stakeholder partnership again, right out of the gate. Uh, and next please, and just my, my final point here is that um, this was actually built upon in a very rapid way into something called N3C that um, um, tried to pull together uh, a data collaborative in a hurry for COVID-19. So um, what they've been focusing on is analyzing patient level data, which is what we want um, for many uh, clinical centers to reveal patterns. And um, they managed to get this up and running in less than two months, which is uh, extraordinarily fast. Um, so I, I guess the point um, being here is that we do have examples really from some we've heard about and, and uh, additional ones named here that we can draw from and we don't have to do it um, all the same way. Um, we have several things uh, that, that can work. So I, I just also, as my very last slide, I just put contact information there. Um, you know, if you have questions about any of these programs, please feel free to, to contact us. Uh, and thanks, thanks very much for for those comments. Uh, uh, really appreciate it. Um, so next is uh, Vanessa. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, great. Okay, great. Um, so thanks so much. Um, and I'd I just like to start out by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to participate in the discussion over the last two days. There's been a lot of really great discussion around challenges and just how big of a task we have ahead of us. But I've also heard real thought leadership and passion for overcoming and rethinking how best we can work together to improve the availability and usability of rare disease data. So some of my key takeaways through you know, a patient organization lens are the really critical need for that foundational information and natural history data for rare conditions to be collected. So, you know, really underscoring the importance of each and every data point, the need for consensus and thought around the right type of data to be collected in the right way and most appropriately for the defined purpose. Um, I believe it was Rebecca Lee who said earlier where the patient community is engaged, the data gets shared and I really couldn't agree more. Um, the rare disease community, so, you know, patients, caregivers, patient organizations, they are really critical stakeholders and must be engaged in meaningful ways to ensure that their insight benefits efforts, that there's buy-in into the initiatives that we're developing, in addition to opportunities for them to co-design how processes and infrastructure and tools are developed and enhanced. So, you know, if we want people to be engaged, I think we need to engage them. Um, and I very much think that patient organizations in many ways are the nexus. They're the most, you know, in tune with the community. They are in a, a powerful position to really unify and bridge stakeholders around a common goal or a common mission to encourage data sharing for their community across sponsors. So, you know, engaging patient organizations and communities is really needed as part of the solution. And then just my sort of last point, I think at this stage is just, um, I heard a lot about the importance of, of really early and thoughtful broad planning. So thinking about future use cases for data, thinking about you know, future uses for data collection or opportunities for the use of that data that really allow for flexible data use and designing for sort of the most rigorous use case. So designing for regulatory use because that is the ultimate goal even if that is a future goal. So that ultimately the data that's collected, that hard-earned data from the community can really be used as broadly and expeditiously as possible. <laughs> thank you. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Vanessa. I appreciate the um, emphasis on how uh, patient organizations can really help uh, uh, drive these efforts to uh, establish and extend uh, collaborative research networks. Um, and uh, next I'd like to turn to Klaus. Uh, thanks, Mark. So first, let me let me start with a shout out to you, Mark, and, and Sarah, and everybody at uh, Dupont Gold. You, you did an amazing job putting this uh, together, and, and thanks, especially to Sarah with the with the patience with uh, with me. 
Um, so this was this was amazing. I mean, yeah, at the end of the day, just to recap the the meeting, I think we can all agree that this is all about uh, the the individuals living with with rare diseases and their families, and, and how do we how do we help them in the most efficient way possible? And one aspect that is was a recurring theme, a common denominator across the meeting was the the, the discussion about generating mechanisms to facilitate the generation of, of true actionable solutions that can facilitate and accelerate uh, medical product development to truly help uh, those individuals and their and their families. And then the the question is, how do we get there? Well, we talked about. Uh, the, the fact that uh, every data point is pressure and we need to maximize their, their value and utility. Uh, in doing so, we, we need to think about not having to reinvent the wheel, learning from uh, other areas in the non-rare disease uh, space, but also learn across uh, rare diseases, even in, in diseases where the, uh, the clinical manifestations and the, and the patient needs might not be necessarily exactly the same, that some concepts of, of solutions that, and, and uh, success stories that uh, can be leveraged across many different uh, disease areas uh, need to be properly communicated and the thought process needs to be uh, focused on identifying what are the aspects of those success stories that can be properly adapted and contextualized for the uh, rest of, of uh, the rare disease uh, space. Uh, the other bit that, that uh, was uh, also touched on is the, the need to really instill some uh, incentives for training. And uh, one, one of the things that, that I think is important is in, in, um, in, the, in the training of new scientists and new clinicians uh, to instill the, the, the thinking about the importance of, of uh, regulatory science uh, and, and data science in, in everything that, that uh, is, is happening uh, today and that will only grow in the, in the future. Um, and if, if we all pull uh, together and uh, collaborate and, and make this happen, we'll get to the end result of being able to properly identify and quantify variability, heterogeneity, and decrease uncertainty. Um, and that way, the, in the future, I'd, I'd like for us to be able to look at the past and, and uh, be able to say that uh, um, these kinds of collaborations in the rare disease uh, space were, were really uh, transformative for uh, embedding uh, true decision science into, into drug development and, and uh, regulatory decision making. So yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And uh, again, Mark, thanks so much for, for recording all this. Oh, great, Th thanks, uh, thank you too. But we're not quite done. <laughs> a little bit more discussion here on, uh, on all of this. So stay, stay put, but uh, I appreciate the, uh, the shout out to the, the Duke and, and FDA teams that, that made this possible, as well as uh, uh, your comments about um, what the best practices are here that we need to extend. Um, so next I'd like to go to Billy. You can make sure you're off mute, uh, Billy. Okay, um, so we may not be able to. Oh, there you Mark, go. Are you, right. Got you. Yeah. Can you can you just confirm that you can hear me? I can hear you just fine. Thank you. Great, Mark. It's great to see you, and great to see you're doing well. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to participate. I'm sorry about the delay there. I had the infamous Zoom double mute going on. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's great to be here. I've been listening to the whole meeting. Uh, I think a lot of folks who work in this space know how passionate I am about data sharing. Uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, again, I'm the director of the Office of Neuroscience at the FDA, formerly the director of the Division of Neurology Products. Uh, data sharing is a is a critical issue and something I believe in very strongly. It's one of the reasons I speak on behalf of it frequently uh, within uh, and without the agency. Um, I, I participate in multiple data sharing initiatives for large diseases like Alzheimer's, as well as uh, virtually a, every data sharing effort going on uh, through FDA-supported efforts in the neurology space. Uh, the consortia at CPATH or at the Critical Path Institute are a very good example of that. Rare diseases are critical uh, to my area. Um, you know, neurological diseases uh, include many more rare diseases than any other organ-specific category. You know, over 80% of the about 7,000 rare diseases are neurological. So we have a great deal of experience with this. 
uh, at the agency in terms of uh, scientific evaluations and, and drug development. Um, and the lessons that we have learned, much like oncology has learned a lot of lessons in rare disease, uh, are, are very appropriate to, to share and, and benefit amongst all the different uh, specialties and disease areas that are affected, affected by these conditions. And it's something that um, I, have, I have seen firsthand how we have been able to move forward with, with effective, uh, effective drug development. So often cancer, as we've heard during this meeting, is celebrated as an area of of significant accomplishment, and not the least of which is due to uh, shared data and, and integrated approaches to, to the investigations and, and care of the patient. And so I think the data sharing, you know, it has the potential to move so many of our non-cancer rare diseases, uh, many of which, as I said, are predominantly neurological and thus can be poorly understood, but also exist in other disease areas. It can move this into a cancer-like situation uh, with enhanced biological understanding and resultant ability to have high degree of specificity in our treatment targeting. Uh, aggregated data speaks directly to this opportunity. Um, we really need to, to shift our paradigms in areas uh, of medicine that do not operate this way uh, to build research participation into the infrastructure uh, of rare disease treatment. And that has to happen on the part of patients, physicians, and institutions, you know, all, all of us, whatever, whatever role we play, you know, whatever level we're participating in the system, we need to understand that centralized structured research efforts are critical to understanding these diseases and, and all the more so in, in rare diseases. It's really a broad statement, but it's so absolutely critical in rare disease because, you know, people often talk about the shots on goal that you have. And in rare disease, we often get a, a single shot and it's usually underinformed. It's not as precisely placed as we want it to be. And so we have to leverage everything. Every single piece of data is critical in the rare disease space. Uh, we really can't let anything go by the wayside. Sometimes in a larger disease space, we have the opportunity to focus on aggregating, uh, you know, a, a, an abundance of large clinical trials, often commercial in scale, and have very high quality data built into them. In the rare disease space, we have to leverage platforms like some of the ones that we've heard today and some of the ones that I have the opportunity to work with that are open and receptive to all disease uh, uh, sources, all data sources uh, regarding various diseases. We have to find ways to prospectively consider uh, data quality and data standards and ensure that we are uh, bringing in data from disparate sources, whether it be an individual provider's uh, uh, comprehensive you know, internal registry uh, to, to, a, to a large scale, though perhaps small uh, patient population enrolled, uh, commercial scale trial. All of these sources of data have to be have to be integrated well. Uh, we have a great example of what can be accomplished in a short time with that in the rare disease space with something like the Duchenne Regulatory Science Consortium, the DRSC. Uh, that consortium uh, was founded a short time ago, and when I think about how recently we had no therapies available in Duchenne and, and recognizing that we still need to evaluate the clinical benefit of our, of our therapies more carefully, but when I think about what we've been able to do when we were trying to sort out the data that was being presented to us and the scientific community was, was trying to understand the data that were being uh, conveyed. Uh, and, and now we have a consortium which has aggregated uh, the data from a, a huge amount of, of the work that's been done in the space, ranging from academically oriented registries uh, to the various trials conducted in industry. Uh, and we have a tremendous amount of buy-in in that consortium, which is now much more fully informing our ability to continue to move the Duchenne space forward. Uh, you know, Jane Larkindale, who's here, has been instrumental in, in uh, accomplishing that, and it's a real kind of shining star of what we can do quickly when, there, when there's buy-in. Uh, data sharing is, is such an important aspect of what we're going to need to do, and it's, it's one of the reasons that the agency has supported it so strongly. Our Rare Disease Cures Accelerator, as we heard in the introductory comments yesterday, something that I and uh, some of my staff, like Dr. Campbell, who's been on the phone, are, are intimately involved in at every level from founding to steering committee and day-to-day -day operations. Um, we, we really believe very strongly in the, the need and, and the opportunity uh, for the Cures Accelerator with, with all three of its components, the data and analytics plat platform, which is directly related to the data sharing topic of today, as well as its other two arms, which have to do with clinical trials networks and standardized clinical outcomes, all have the opportunity to revolutionize our approaches to uh, drug development uh, for rare diseases, therapeutic development. We have an opportunity to more fully characterize these diseases that are often 
uh, poorly understood or, or less well understood than they need to be uh, to fully inform a couple different things. You know, one is that the more data that come in, uh, the more opportunity we have for our, our skilled scientists at all levels, from basic scientists to uh, large-scale clinical trialists, to enhance their scientific understanding of the underlying aspects of these rare diseases. Uh, even when we might understand the genetic component of the disease, we might need to understand a great deal more about its, its downstream effects, its biomarker profile, its pathophysiological outputs. And as we gain that scientific understanding, we can enhance mechanistically specific targeting on some of those fundamental aspects of the disease and ideally move beyond uh, treating symptoms in a patient to really fundamentally affecting the core of the disease and, and resulting in durable changes. Natural history characterization is so important when you get to the point of, of actually conducting the trials that are intended to provide the evidence that the patients need to know that, that a therapy is going to benefit, uh, which, is, which is obviously what we're about in the regulatory space as well. Um, you know, I'm often fond of saying that you know, good, good, good regulatory activities are essentially just good science. Uh, it's a little dry to read the regulations, but they essentially describe you know, good scientific approaches and methods and the more that we apply those, the more we'll have an ability to have our trials be the result of well-informed good science. Um, you know, the more we understand the natural history of a given disease, we can, uh, we can use that information to assess for critical aspects like uh, appropriateness of enrollment criteria, uh, disease staging in a progressive condition, appropriate study powering, appropriate selection of outcome measures that, that uh, align with the stage of a given disease, and ultimately, this, these, uh, these aggregated data, this more com compelled, compelling understanding of these disease can help us with the interpretability of the results. Um, something rare disease uh, uh, communities are very interested in, as, as are we at the agency, is how to enhance our approach to control groups, a, a really important aspect of interpretability when, does, when uh, conducting drug development. And when we have such a limited patient population, such, such a valuable resource, we need to maximize the contribution of every willing patient's uh, participation in any research endeavor at all. So particularly with regard to the use of external or augmented control groups, which can be critical for considerations from rare disease, the more, the more fully informed we are uh, in terms of aggregated quality interpretable data, the more we're going to be able to consider those types of approaches, which we know are critical to our patient communities. Uh, building in quality uh, uh, to the approach and gathering of data uh, really enhances our ability to conduct innovative trial designs, uh, whether, whether using uh, an innovative trial design in terms of um, uh, outcome approach or statistical methodology for a single agent, or whether contemplating the use of master protocols, which we've heard some commentary again in the oncology space of how successful that's been. There's a great interest in this in the rare disease space. We've had some initial discussions in areas like uh, amyotrophic, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, uh, but master protocols can be, can be implemented uh, the m easier, the more well uh, we understand the disease. And that again brings us back to uh, the, the value and the benefit downstream of bringing data in aggressively in advance. So data sharing is something that we need to think about in advance. It needs to be front-loaded while not, not failing to benefit from the opportunity of, of bringing extant data in after the fact. Uh, as, we, as we buy into this and have this increasingly be what we do prospectively, all data will be gathered in a way that can uh, have built-in quality assurance, uh, built-in built data governance, um, uh, management activities, respect for patient privacy, respect for data security. Uh, this can all be done in a front-loaded, pre-competitive way, uh, which whether the competition is regarding intellectual activities on the academic side or scientific achievement, or whether it's commercial uh, competitive activities uh, with our, with our uh, commercial scale developers, all of these pre-competitive activities uh, benefit uh, each of those entities ultimately, uh, in, even with regard to competitive goals. So it's really increasingly an expectation. And I could argue that with regard to the comment earlier about w what would be a good incentive, what way to, to provide a greater incentive for people to participate, you know, I, I think that notwithstanding the fact that we all encounter challenges, and we talked about a number of those, I think we really have the horses out of the gate on this one. I think that data sharing has become accepted. When I think about the volume 
of activities I'm involved in regarding data sharing compared to even just a few years ago, let alone 10 years ago. It, it's, it's, a, it's a real sea change. And I think the incentive is, is quite simple. I, I think it's become accepted as a, a scientific and uh, public health and, in fact, you know, almost moral necessity uh, to recognize, especially in the rare disease space, that if we're going to do good scientists, if we're going to uh, 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 represent the patients who, on, on whom who we're working for, if we're going to represent them well, we must leverage every opportunity we have to learn maximally, and data sharing is a way to do that. So I, I think that when, when confronted uh, uh, in that way with, with why should I do this, I think it, it's pretty easy to get by, and I haven't seen much resistance to, to that. Uh, there's obviously unique aspects to things that we have to deal with. Commercial scale entities are very concerned with intellectual property. Um, uh, uh, scientific laboratories, academics obviously have, have spent great effort uh, and, and have great value in some of the registries that they've obtained over time. And a respect for the, those, uh, those efforts needs always to be maintained. But the good of the field is something that is, is really a compelling, a compelling motivator uh, and, and I think is, uh, is really increasingly bought into uh, by most of our folks. So I guess in recognizing you want to have some discussion, I'll, I'll stop there. It should be clear that I believe very, very strongly in this. Uh, it, is, it is something that we, we really must do. Uh, we must build this into every activity organizations uh, like we've seen today. Many of the efforts that uh, our sister agency, the NIH has, the effort that we're funding and making through the RDCA, uh, platforms like the Critical Path Institute, uh, who have been who have been here today and classes on this panel can can speak more directly to that. Our partnership with us is on the panel with Nord, um, who is absolutely critical in their in their skill with regard to reaching out to rare disease communities and providing aggregated op opportunities for aggregated gathering uh, of data for communities who might not otherwise uh, know how to get their their voice and their valuable data contributed. Uh, we're really working together in a way that is, uh, is, has me wonderfully optimistic. So I'll stop there and look forward to whatever discussion you want to have, Mark. Great. Uh, uh, thanks very much, Billy, and thanks to all of our discussants for uh, their comments to help us uh, uh, think about how we're wrapping up and moving forward. You're seeing on the screen uh, uh, some questions that we'd like to, to prompt you all for any further comments to add in the chat or questions to ask in the chat or uh, in our remaining, you know, 15, uh, 20 minutes uh, uh, together on this. Uh, but I did want to start off by just emphasizing or, or noting uh, the strong emphasis that that so many of you all have placed on the importance of uh, reliable, pre-competitive, high-quality data sharing uh, built into um, the infrastructure of care and connected to supporting um, uh, regulatory uses of, of these data for um, clinical trial and, and, and other purposes. Uh, a lot of the comments in this session came back to, to that theme, including um, uh, Billy's, including um, uh, where Anne started on, on how that was uh, uh, progression in, in for data sharing was critical to, to progress on cancer, which now looks a lot more like a, a whole collection of, of rare diseases in itself, uh, in, in themselves, which are you know, sort of much easier to, to study because such a, a good um, uh, system is in place. Um, but maybe to, to kick this off, we go back to Eileen. I saw Eileen, you had a couple of comments in the, the chat, uh, including about uh, what does data sharing mean to patients, which I assume gets back to how we um, uh, advance uh, uh, this work. And in, in your session, we talked uh, about a range of types of data sharing, including demographic and typical clinical trial information, as well as genomic uh, imaging, patient reported information, and, and increasingly data from electronic record sources and, and other uh, components of care. So maybe you could um, expand on your, your comment a little bit as we uh, get going in this, um, in this final discussion. So I, I, I hear that patients and the patient advocacy, advocacy groups talk about data sharing, but my question is, what does that mean to them? Does that mean they want to they they want to have access to individual patient level data so they can do their own analyses? Does this mean that they just want access to what are the results of analyses or that 
that are done so that they know what we've learned from the studies that they participated in. Um, I'm just kind of curious as to when when they say we want we want data sharing, what exactly that means. Yeah, maybe Vanessa, I could start with with you on responding to that. <laughs> And I think you're still on mute. Uh, uh, maybe it was one of these uh, double mute situations or something. Just, Tina, I'll go really quick if uh, she's not popping on yet. Give her time to okay. find her mute buttons. Okay, um, thanks. One of the things our, our, our very own Eileen, RDCRN, and CPAG people have come to us is they, they want to talk about data sharing. They know they're supposed to do it, but then they also asked us for a session to discuss and define what data sharing is, what data standards are, and what it really means. So I, I think a lot of them, especially the smaller groups, um, know it's something that they're supposed to be doing, but don't have a deep understanding of, of the mechanics behind why it's important. Mm -hmm. Great, and Vanessa, I'm not sure if you're uh, back yet, but not quite yet. Okay, uh, any other uh, comments on this topic of uh, uh, really connecting uh, patients to uh, uh, this, this goal of uh, progressively enhancing uh, data sharing? Um, Mark, this is Teresa uh, at FDA. Uh, uh -huh. And I just wanna add that, um, and I, I see that Vanessa's on there, so maybe she'll figure out how to unmute. But in the meantime, one of the things NORD has done as part of the RDCA larger effort for us, they've done some very good webinars and they've done one oriented to patients. And I wonder if, and I'm sure Vanessa can, make sure you get the link to this because it, it does a very nice job of describing what this means for patients and what patients might do and, and tries to give them some, uh, you know, some, some, some background on this and orient them to it. And, uh, and they have a few other webinars to, to uh, geared to different audiences, but that might be a, a, a nice resource for, for your folks, Eileen. That's a great point. Um, Vanessa, I'm gonna try, uh, try again. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Uh, all right, still, still working on it. I know it can be done. We had some great comments from you earlier. Um, uh, Klaus, it looked like you were gonna add something. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, in addition to what Teresa mentioned, uh, the, the, the partnership with Nord has been, has been awesome for us. Uh, the the one, one thing that we, we've heard across the board, and, and this is not just about uh, the, the groups of patients that, that uh, are in the rare disease space, when an individual with a disease and of course, that this is especially true for rare diseases and their families put in the time to participate in research, whether it be a patient registry, an observational study, or uh, a clinical trial, or even when they agree to have uh, their their uh, electronic health records uh, through the contributions that they make by by you know showing up at the at the clinical visits. Uh, they, they put in the time, they contribute their information. W one thing that we have heard as a common denominator is that they don't want their, the, the value of their data just to be uh, used once for the primary analysis of those studies. They, they want to see their data, their time, their contributions uh, live beyond the, the primary analysis of, of uh, a single study. And so that's one component of uh, the, the quote unquote, what's in it for me angle uh, to your question. Uh, I mean, regarding what they, what they see as data sharing. And in reality, all, all, all this that is driving this is, is that, that uh, desire to make sure that their contributions live on uh, and, and get maximized. That's, that's what we've heard. But Vanessa, you can, you can certainly comment way, way more. And I, I think Vanessa is trying to to reconnect. And as soon as we get her back, uh, we definitely want to we, we definitely want to hear from her. Um, for for now, just to build on on your comment, um, uh, Klaus, you know, we have heard today about a, a number of steps to facilitate uh, uh, this kind of uh, of data sharing, including 
um, the development and application of, of standards, uh, including uh, analytic tools and, and utilities that these um, uh, common shared platforms can put together, uh, including, as you were just talking about, ways of sharing results back, or as we've seen going in the chat, some discussions about making uh, the, the shared data accessible to, uh, uh, to more researchers so that um, uh, more people can, and, and to the, uh, the patient communities themselves, so that more people can, can learn from, from what's uh, coming out of all that. Uh, so that all seems good. It also um, gets back to one other theme that's come up, which is um, how can we do this for the, the broader uh, rare disease uh, community, not just uh, disease by disease by disease. And I wonder if um, uh, any of our uh, panelists uh, um, would like to, to comment on the tools or the, the approaches that they seem uh, that they think are, are most helpful to build on now uh, so that uh, we don't have to not only just reinvent the wheel across studies, but, but uh, avoid reinventing the wheel uh, across uh, our rare diseases. Again, this scenario would be great to have Vanessa's uh, comment, but um, uh, Klaus and uh, Billy, any, any comments on that? Yeah, this is Billy, Mark. I'm happy to, just, to, to address that because I think it speaks directly to the, um, uh, to the Rare Disease Cures Accelerator data analytics platform that we that we're supporting and have launched in collaboration with Critical Path Institute and NORD. Um, what we want to do and what we have done, I mean, it's, it's live, is, is specifically avoid that fractured approach to infrastructural requirements uh, so that we can leverage uh, uh, infrastructure across all rare diseases. Uh, the RDCA DAP has the ability to take in virtually any sort of data in any disease. Klaus is on the panel and he can talk about this with much greater technical sophistication than I can. But the opportunity to bring in all data sources across any rare disease uh, in a standardized, aggregated, curated, and, cur and queryable way uh, by investigators uh, or by developers or by the agency itself is really a, 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 an incredible advance in our opportunity to, to understand these diseases. So, Disease communities, which otherwise might need to uh, stand up their own effort and might lack the resources to do so, or might not even be well organized enough to, uh, to, to even take that step, now have a place uh, to, to bring the data and have it um, contributed and maintained in, in a way that enhances its regulatory quality and its scientific quality uh, such that it's germane to almost any effort for which it, it, it could be valuable. Second, secondly, by having the data in this common, uh, this common approach, it really facilitates something that somebody else spoke about earlier, which is the opportunity to not limit our investigations and queries to a single disease, but to investigate and, and elucidate uh, patterns across similar and related diseases. And one of the most exciting things is recognizing that we may uh, have the opportunity to discover similarities that we don't know right now. Uh, so we might understand, say, a group of neuromuscular or neurocognitive disorders, and we can go in and look at those uh, across shared markers or characteristics, but we might actually be able to run queries on these aggregated data that reveal patterns within the scientific data that allow us to reconceptualize certain diseases and understand that shared characteristics or traits may allow us to make advances in our scientific understanding that would otherwise have been unavailable to us with only discrete limited data sets. So it's a very, very powerful matrix, matrixed cross-referential uh, set. And Klaus, I don't know if you want to speak to that any further. Yeah, no, thanks, well, Bill. I, I would like you to speak to it, but uh, but but uh, br briefly, if possible, because I, I do think we have um, uh, Vanessa yeah. back connected. But uh, please, uh, please go ahead if you have something you'd like to add. Or okay, let's go. Let's go to Vanessa. <laughs> um, thanks, Klaus. Um, and just uh, building on uh, Vanessa, thanks for for trying so hard to connect. Uh, uh, but uh, please add uh, whatever comments you'd like to to make at this point. Yes, so sorry about that. My line was switched to attendee for somehow, so <laughs> thanks for your patience. Um, I just actually wanted to start with the first question very briefly, if I, if I could. Um, I think what data sharing means to patients and families, like if you really think about who we're asking to share their data, it's, it's a big lift, right? It's already people who are managing and balancing a whole lot, so there's 
a commitment to driving forward progress for their conditions because it's very often they're finding themselves in devastating positions. Um, but then of course there's a real commitment to seeing that data be used as broadly and as, as widely as possible. So I think from the like patient family perspective, really like making sure that there are principles that guide the use of the data, but also ensuring that the data can be used as for as many use cases as possible is really what we hear kind of over and over again. Um, and then just to the RDCA adapt question was the question around like how we can sort of speed the process. Yeah, so, and, and potentially extend, um, you know, common principles or, or tools or approaches across multiple diseases. Yeah, I saw a question in the chat about COA measures. So mm -hmm. I think Billy earlier had mentioned that um, one of like the sort of second goal of the Rare Disease Cures Accelerator initiative is around standardizing COA measures and um, Nord and CPATH are actually working on a project that is looking kind of at doing a landscape analysis, like a, a landscape assessment of COA measures that have been used in rare diseases that, you know, are either published for use in, in the literature or that they are um, indicated in approvals, like labeling approvals. Um, and we're also actually doing sort of a ground up approach where we're working with the community to understand how they're implementing COA measures or capturing sort of endpoint data in uh, natural history studies as well. And so the idea there is that this, it's this multi-stakeholder consortium that's sort of overseeing the curation of these COA measures and then creating guidance around the appropriate use of the measures, you know, the, the right population for use, um, strengths and limitations, psychometric properties, all to be made publicly available. And this is all pre-competitive, so it's it's a lot. It's a large consortium of of um, you know pharmaceutical companies that are really looking to collaborate together on identifying um, how the right endpoints for the right for specific conditions, so that data across these trials could be potentially compared or at least interpretable across trials. So, I I do think that. Um, there's sort of data sharing or information sharing, at least at that level as well, that's sort of driving forward how, how we can more rapidly make progress for rare diseases across conditions. Great, uh, thank you. And thanks for your persistence in getting back on. We just add, um, there's been a, some good discussion in, in uh, uh, the chat, uh, Ron Bartek, uh, Teresa Mullins and, and others around uh, this point on clinical outcome assessment measures. Uh, being uh, in common across uh, at least some rare diseases, especially neurologic conditions, and some of the work that FDA is supporting to try to develop uh, consistent measure sets um, and uh, uh, really take advantage of exactly the opportunities that you all have been discussing. So, so uh, thanks, Vanessa, for for your work on that. Uh, Klaus, Klaus, I didn't mean to cut you off, but uh, very no, briefly, okay. uh, a final comment. <laughs> it's okay. No, the Vanessa uh, covered a, a good chunk of it, as did Billy. Um, the the one thing that I that I would add is is a bit of a, an analogy that that we use when we when we kicked um, RDCA uh, DAP off uh, last September. If you think of a of a way by which you can uh, develop a, a, a very uh, well thought out architecture for each disease to have the opportunity to park their cars in that well architecture parking lot uh, in a way that allows research to be done on that individual car, but not just that, also be able to run analyses that uh, pick out all the cars with automatic transmissions that are in the parking lot and all the cars that have uh, hybrid engines. Uh, and that, that, that speaks to the interoperability of the data. One example that, that uh, is, is starting to uh, materialize is, is in ataxias, plural. We started with uh, things, things to run, uh, a, a very um, nice integrated database in, in Friedrich's ataxia, but we're aiming to get additional uh, data sources from multiple ataxias. And given the commonalities, but also the differences, which I mean, it's it's all part of the same um, thinking. The commonalities, but also the all important differences in a tax is how we will be uh, able 
to, again, quantitatively identify the source of variability, disease trajectories, disease characterization, uh, commonalities and differences in terms of uh, certain longitudinal measures, et cetera, and replicating lessons uh, across all, all other uh, areas. We have also a, a bit of a, a demonstration project with uh, kidney transplantation, which is uh, has orphan status designation, and polycystic kidney disease, where some of those uh, patients that have PKD end up uh, needing a transplant. And we, we do have some of those overlapping patients Back to the question of the of the ability of being able to identify those overlapping patients across studies, where we're uh, looking at at some longitudinal measures that span both uh, stages of the of the life of those individuals when they were a, a PKD patient, uh, all the way to the development of end stage renal disease and the need for a transplant and what happened with their with their lives after the after the tra the transplant. So those are the kinds of things that that this this kind of collaboration. Uh, brings to the table, and so this is extremely exciting, and uh, I can't, I can't, I can't wait to do more and have more of these interactions. Great. Well, I want to um, help uh, let us close on that point. I want to thank all of the panelists for this final session. Uh, as uh, Klaus was just saying, uh, it does seem like we there's a, a lot of activity and a lot of momentum around a good, uh, in many cases, common architecture uh, for the, the, you know, the patients are unique, the diseases are in many ways unique, but uh, a real opportunities for continued progress on uh, data, meaningful data sharing to get to uh, regulatory uh, action and support using collaborative research networks. And if, uh, if not a point where we've got a lot of a foundation to build on and a lot of momentum, maybe even an, an inflection point uh, in, um, in making progress in these areas. So I want to thank everyone who contributed on this and the previous panels to help making clear uh, just what kind of opportunity we have in front of us. And, and I hope we'll uh, use this meeting to make the most of it. So thanks to our presenters, our panelists, the other experts uh, uh, with us for such an engaging uh, final session and such an engaging two days um, for making that possible. I know Klaus uh, did some of my uh, thanks earlier, but I do want to reiterate it because they're so important uh, in making this event uh, a success. Uh, all of you who participated in the meeting, our panelists, uh, uh, all of you contributed to chat and questions and uh, suggestions along the way. Uh, it's great to see such a diverse uh, group of, of individuals and people with so much expertise uh, and commitment to, to progress in, the, uh, in, in rare diseases. Uh, we're, we uh, very much look forward to making the most use of all the feedback we've gathered today and across this uh, two-day program. Uh, second, uh, special thanks to all the FDA staff that played an instrumental role in planning this meeting and in helping us uh, execute it. Uh, Teresa Mullen, Robin Bent, uh, Free Jemaru, and members of the technical advisory group at FDA uh, who all contributed to making the meeting possible. Uh, and last, a special thanks to the Duke Margolis team, uh, Sarah Sheehan, Mira Gill, Kelly Wall, and Mara Wasinska uh, for all of their efforts to put this event together. Uh, we're, we're definitely not done, uh, but it's been great to see all of the progress and, and all of the, the opportunities that, that lie ahead. Uh, thank you for your contributions to the meeting. There's going to be a recording available as well as all the print materials uh, that, uh, that you received here. They're going to be archived on our website, so, so look for that uh, if you want to, to link to or, or, or build from what you've heard today. And we look forward to continuing to collaborate with you on these uh, very important issues for advancing care uh, and improving outcomes for uh, all the people who are affected by rare diseases. Thank you very much and, and enjoy the rest of the day.